It's time for Twig This Week in Google. The old gang is back. Gina, Jeff, and Aaron Newcomb will talk about Android devices at CES, new plans for Google+, Plus, and a whole lot more. It's all coming up next on Twig. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twig. Bandwidth for This Week in Google is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twig, This Week in Google, episode 180, recorded January 9th, 2013. Hashtag Backlash. This Week in Google is brought to you by LegalZoom.com. LegalZoom is not a law firm. LegalZoom provides self help services at your direction, such as affordable business and personal documents you can trust. Visit LegalZoom.com and use the offer code TWIG to receive $10 off at checkout. And by Stamps.com. Use Stamps.com to buy and print real U.S. postage the instant you need it right from your desk. For our special offer, go to Stamps.com now. Click on the microphone and enter TWIG. And by Ting.com. Ting is a new mobile phone service that makes sense. Save money with Ting. Pay for what you use. Ting doesn't require a contract and offers unlimited devices on one pooled plan. To save $25 on your first Ting device, visit twig.ting.com. It's time for Twig this week in Google. And we got the A-team back. Nothing wrong with the bizarro Google uh, we did last week, but this week in Google really <laughs> isn't the same without that guy there, Mr. Jeff Jarvis, ladies and gentlemen. Group hug. Group hug. Aww. And this lady here, Ms. Gina Trapani. And Hi. And, and Aaron Newcomb's here, too, which is great. Hey. So we, it's the source show. And Aaron brought his old radio with him, and he's still getting Franklin Delano Roosevelt speeches <laughs> on his radio. And That's I amazing. think. Call it a romantic That's a lot of latency, huh? Who lost causes. And he's got old radio Walter, on there. Confederate officer. Walter, you are not being logical. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the story's interesting. It's a Raspberry no, Pi in there. That's right. So what I did was I took an old Philco radio, uh, circa 1940-something. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the date is. And went ahead and put a Raspberry Pi in. I should roll um, it over here. Can you roll it over here, Burke, so we can see can it roll between, it between me and Aaron? <clears throat> So it's pretty interesting because I really wanted to, I've got a big, pretty big library of old time radio shows and uh, I thought what better way to listen to them than on an actual old time radio or out of an actual old time and radio. And the Pi's LEDs even glow blue, which I love through the through the grill. So the Pi is in the back and uh, it's hooked up to Wi-Fi and I wrote a little web page control for it so I can skip tracks and, and change the volume and things like that. Because it's a little bit difficult to do that when it's just, you know, you, it, that's meant to be set on a table and you kind of forget it, right? This is your grandpa's so. radio, but it doesn't work the same as it used to. Yeah. That is yeah. so neato. It actually is. I talked about it um, last time I was here, I think, at the end of the show. I mentioned I was working on it. That's great. And How hard was that to do? It wasn't hard at all, actually. Raspberry Pi is so user-friendly. If you if you know Linux, if you know how to set up a web server or how to do just about anything in Linux, uh, especially if you know how to do it on the command line, it's really easy to get the Raspberry Pi up and running and, and get it to do whatever you want. And is the web page in PHP? What is How's that work? The web page is actually a Perl CGI script because um, I know Perl better than mm -hmm. PHP. Mm -hmm. So I did it in Perl and uh, loaded uh, light... Uh, I'm not sure exactly how you say it. Lighty. Light HTTP. Light yeah, 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 exactly. It, it's a web server. Yeah, commonly known as Lighty. So I put Lighty on there, and uh, and it was up and running. Actually, the, the it took me about five hours, I think. The web server is running on the Raspberry Pi. Web server is running say. on the Raspberry Pi. So you can connect from your, you know, I can connect from my Android. I can connect from my laptop, change the tracks, change you the volume. You can do it from your Android. Yeah. The neat thing about this is it, the Raspberry Pi was, what, 30 bucks? 35. I guess the Wi-Fi one is a little more expensive. Yeah, this 35. one, the one with networking, the Ethernet built-in is uh, 35 and uh, now you will there it is. You stop the animals. Let me alone. We have had vibration <laughs> levels one. This is Dimension ten. X still, I think. There are still There's no reason you couldn't have twi oh, or yeah, Twig. Absolutely. It, you, it, see, it's all running through. It's all running through M Player. So M Player can stream across the internet. So you could actually run Twitch shows if you wanted to. Just have it running all the time. No. Um, are you using how much? Original speakers? What? No. No, I, I couldn't Just because the they were they were powered speakers. Yeah. And right. Okay, right. The, plus the wires were so, the the wires were so degraded. I mean, you wouldn't really there want to do that. That's There's true. the that's what's actually running it. Oh, sweet! Um, that's the guts just in the the bag. Raspberry Pi, a little USB hub, an Ethernet uh, dongle. Total cost? Uh, less than fifty dollars. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm telling you, man, you got a business there. 
Make I mean, that, just go buy a bunch of old radios and make those. There's a business. I'll tell you what. I mean, I encourage anyone, anyone that's into making or hacking and they want to get into this, I really encourage them to go out. I mean, it's I'm not getting that much. one. I want to do that. That's awesome. You got to awesome. get one. You got to get one. 35 bucks, you can't, you can't go wrong. So, and the nice thing about it is it's all running off of an SD card. Mm -hmm. So I can change this from this. I can pull out the Raspberry Pi, stick in another SD card and have it be a media server running on my network, streaming media or playing my videos or whatever I want. When I'm tired of that, take out the SD card, stick in another one and it's back to the old time it's radio. Pretty, so. pretty darn. Really cool. Cool. It's a lot of fun. Really cool. Yeah. A lot of fun. I knew Gina. I said, Gina, when she sees this, will squee. Yeah, part, right, part, right. One half of me is squeeing, the other part of me is going like nerds. Nerds, nerds. <laughs> but I have to say, I'm kicking myself. I haven't played Raspberry Pi nearly enough, and so that looks like a really pretty cool neat. project. Yeah. yeah, it's really neat. Thanks. So, how was? Uh, we're gonna do a little because uh, we haven't seen each other in a while. So, pardon us, folks. You can fast forward if you want, but I just want to find out how everybody is. And how was your holiday, Gina? Was it your baby's first Christmas? Yeah, it was baby's first Christmas. It was wonderful. We had a really nice, uh, chill holiday at home. Very chill New Year. Uh, asleep before midnight because, you know, the baby's up at three, in, at 3 in the morning, so it wasn't very exciting. It's but funny. You really pretty much, the end of your staying up to midnight has happened. You will never again <laughs> stay up till midnight. Yeah, no. Because you got 18 years of going to bed at 10, and then you're so old, it's like, well, I'm going yeah. to bed. <laughs> Whatever. I went yeah, to bed at 1030 on New Year's Eve. Oh, yeah. I watched Anderson Cooper and <laughs> Kathy purpose? Griffin. Like, Wasn't that wild? Not Wait a minute. Um, I had never... I, so I'm watching the usual stupid taped in October rocking New Year's Eve. I mean, they literally tape it in October. I had somebody call me and say, you know, uh, last year and say, you know, I was at the uh, Disneyland when they taped the segments with Fergie for rocking New Year's Eve. It was October. <laughs> because yeah, every, So it really feels canned. Yeah. So I'm yeah. turning around saying, why? And nobody, I guess they figure ABC's got it. We're not going to do it. Uh, so China Television, ABC, and then I find CNN. Not only is it live, but Kathy Griffin is apparently attempting to kiss Anderson Cooper's sardine. <laughs> repeatedly <laughs> they were just like he was giggling like it was so funny i thought it was hilarious i was just so happy to find the new york the times square ball drop like on a channel other than like the the, the spanish channel because yeah. here you know here on the west coast it's like you couldn't so i was so thrilled to just do the new york ball drop i texted with all my family on the east coast and it was fine but those two were they were just a mess i, I thought it was hilarious that i loved that it. Anderson was giggling and that she was being so wildly inappropriate <laughs> so inappropriate it was fantastic. And at first I thought, my God, Cooper must be dying. But apparently they do this every year. She disrobed well, last year. They're like BFFs. They put up signs for really? her that says no nudity. <laughs> <laughs> and then Cy, Oppo Gangnam Style, wanders in and stands down screen. So he looks like he's three feet tall. Yeah. Oh, my God. He had no and, idea and where he was. like, this isn't awkward at all. <laughs> I have to say that's New Year's Eve, but it, it inspired me because I realized that they are the only people really covering it live. And by the way, on the West Coast, after nine o'clock, it's like go home, right? Yeah. Because uh, every, New Year's happened in New York. What are you guys doing? Yeah. So you gonna do it, Leo. I'm going to do it, and we're going to do it yeah. Twit style, internet style. We're going to do it 24 hours. We're going to start with the first New Year's Eve in New Zealand. <laughs> oh, there you go. And talk to people via Pray Skype at, at the top of the hour for 24 hours. That's awesome. Just go through. And that's next New Year's. We're planning it already because apparently I have to plan something like that in advance. Are you yeah. Are you going to do a, pull a Jerry Lewis here and be there for the whole I thing? I am. I'm going to wear a tuxedo. By the end, I'll be singing. <laughs> <laughs> and my tuxedo. Are you going to be drinking? I I'll want be in drinking. On this. I want in on this. You yeah. are in on this. You're yeah. our oh, yeah. you're you're our San Diego <laughs> correspondent. All right, good. It just has to be before 10 p.m. Pacific. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you could pretend you're doing Denver or something. <laughs> well, Edna will be big enough. We'll we'll be able to have her on the party hat, and she'll she'll be able to be in on the biz. I th I think we have you know viewers all and listeners all over the world. I think that mm -hmm. we can easily find somebody from every time zone, all 28 of them or something. And uh, and have a, a, a New Year's ball drop, twenty eight ball drops. Eight. Yeah. Yeah, there because there's some half hours in there. That would be really cool. I know. I said the same thing. We and Kevin Mark said, "Oh yeah, you'll have to do it for twenty eight hours because there's twenty eight time zones." He fooled me. <laughs> and then I realized well, it can't possibly be twenty eight hours. This, it, the, the Earth does still revolves around the sun once every twenty four hours. hours. Actually, revolves it, it rotates every twenty four hours. So. I realized, oh, that's because we've got some strange time zones in there. 
Will it be possible to get a live feed from something at every single time zone? Is that that's the challenge? Or uh, it just be it's kind of sitting around. It's the challenge. We're going to create done. a Google Doc and start now, and say if you're going to be in, you know, Perth, if you're going to be anywhere, you know, we have to. It's no, going to your audience. You're going to have people who are going to move time zones that night. Yeah, just to, to, to yeah. do the coverage. Yeah, there's like seven time zones in India. You'll, you'll have your your new Samoan <laughs> fan. Yeah. Yeah, Google Plus Hangout would be perfect for that, because people yeah, could just go. people could just whip out their phones and join go. the Hangout. Hey, look, there's 50 million people behind me or whatever. That's what I want to do. Yep. Oh, I, I have someone in Qatar. I met I met a fan who watches the show in Qatar. At Google perfect. I'll get get him perfect. in touch. Cool. So uh, I invite you all, and uh, <laughs> you've got a year to prepare. <laughs> <laughs> no dos. Buying the no dos now. <laughs> Make a note. So CES is going on right now, and I'm not there. You notice that? And can I tell you how happy I am? You were just in and out for your your keynote was really really good, Leo. Oh, you saw that? I watched eh? it. Yeah, I watched oh, it. Yeah. Well, I haven't watched it I yet. Wish I'd known. I would have been better. <laughs> no, 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 that was very good. I'm glad I didn't very, know. Let's put it that and way. And very open too. You know, Henry Blodgett put up his, some of his business stuff, saying he was open. Nothing compared to you, man. Well, so the, uh, let me explain. I was not keynoting CES, but I was keynoting the New Media Expo. They very wisely decided to uh, move. It's the formerly Blog World and New Media Expo. Now they just call it New. Me it's all New Media, right? Blogs podcasts, YouTubers, it's all the same. And they moved it to right before CES, so they, in Vegas, so the presumption oh. is, and I think it's wise, that people will come for that and CES. Um, and so uh, they asked me to speak, and I did. And as I usually do, I like to tell our story and kind of tell people what it's like and what the opportunity is, what the challenges are, and all that stuff. So it was fun doing it. It's a great audience. Um, and we streamed it, and I think it's a special I think it's a Twit special, so you can go to it. It is. Oh, it's yeah. a Twit special. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, because I got to see that. I, I saw one of your former keynote. You've done this before. Yes. Uh, and you're you're just great, Leo. And, and oh. it looks as if you get up there with zero preparation. Like the, the one that I saw, <laughs> was like he just got up there in his suit. And no, but you were your it's sort true. of regular, charming self, and it's like true. told the story. And like you could tell, you could just you were just kind of doing it right off the off yeah. the cuff. And, and it was great. It was so great. So I'm excited to see. No, this he one. was doing it off the note too. I had a Galaxy Note 2, but that was only because there were some numbers in there. I want to make sure I got those right. Right. And, um, and uh, no, you're exactly right, Gina. I used to prepare, and uh, Lisa told me, stop preparing. Those are the worst keynotes I've ever seen. And so yeah, I, I, I meant that as a compliment. And, like, you, yeah, you came off of someone you. just kind of telling a story, yeah. you know, having conversation. Yeah. That's the best way That's the best way to do it. Yeah. I mean, not many people are talented enough to be able to pull that off, uh, but really it was sort of kind. wonderful. Now that's good. She's, Lisa's right. Lisa's right. I, yeah, she's always right. right. I've learned that. <laughs> she's always right. <laughs> the, the, uh, the truth is this is, this is uh, to me, the most important talk. I've given this talk several times for New Media Expo, the most important talk I do, because... You know, it's tough being a podcaster. Then the next night, I went to the uh, International... You could tell just from the name. The International Academy of Web Television Awards, oh which my. which were done like the Oscars. They had, you know, video bits. They had presenters who had scripts on prompter. It was in a big auditorium. It was very glitzy. People were all dressed up. They had a red carpet. And, uh, and I thought, this is kind of like... This is new media people kind of uh, wearing their mommy's... Uh, uh, high heels, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's kind of we're, we're dressed up, but I have to say the quality of stuff that's being done in episodic web uh, series is pretty amazing. There's some stuff that is very, very mm -hmm. Hollywood quality stuff. Do you guys watch the, what is it? H plus H plus was one of the big oh, winners. My goodness. Yeah. Wow. Um, very well done. I mean, yeah. super high quality. I, I, I hate that it's so short. Cause it's like, I, you, you get into it in that five minute time for whatever it is, you know, and you're I like, I don't know why they oh, think it has to like be fire. short form. I, think I don't it can either. Be long I don't form. get it. Yeah, I think that was a mistake. I think it was I, a big mistake. Because uh, maybe the, 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 the last week thing is longer than the show. Right. Um, right. So did and, you see CES at all, Leo? And then I, I did CES yesterday, Tuesday. So, speak, so speaking of CES, um, if it weren't for Android and Samsung, <laughs> flatline, I'm not kidding. Um, there's a few interesting things, you know, uh, LG had an NFC capable printer. So I took a phone, they have an Android and they have an iOS app, You take, but it works best with uh, Android because you have to have an NFC chip. So you walk up to this little printer. I, I, I posted a video on Facebook because it wasn't, you know, worth doing much more on, but I thought it's worth, show in fact, I could probably show it. Let me see, I probably have it right here. What am I thinking? I've, I've recorded this. <laughs> But it's cool because it uses video. NFC. It's more. It's it's it uses NFC to pair to Bluetooth. I should point out. Mm. Um, 
and then uh, and then it prints. But it's cool because it means you can walk up to an arbitrary printer with your smartphone and uh, and just print. Hmm. And the NFC is built into the printer. Yeah, it's, so it works okay. best with a Note or some sort of Galaxy device because uh, they have the NFC chip in it. Your Nexus would work. Nexus does. Yeah, yeah. anything that. Um, but you have to have this particular printer. Yeah, it's a little. Let me let me go to my Google Plus and. Uh, it, it would be neat if it was an add-on. It was something you plug into an existing printer. You know, with well, the I was, NFC. I was just going to say, I'm sure you could do this with Raspberry Pi pretty easily. Just a matter of yeah. time, isn't it? You just need one of those. You know, one of those little gonna, NFC I'm chips. I'm going to do my Dvorak invitation though and say, if that's the most exciting thing you got out of CES, exactly. Right. <laughs> there was a lot of there was a lot of stuff like that. A lot of kind of chintzy stuff, you know. Uh -huh. I was saying in the pre-show, I started doing all about Android. Uh, last night was our first episode, and, and I and we start, covered some stuff from CES, and I realized, like, I thought I knew a lot about Android until we started talking about Android-powered cameras and Android-powered gaming consoles, yeah. and, yeah. and uh, there's a Vuzix uh, uh, smart glasses with Android. I mm -hmm. mean, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty Samsung incredible. Samsung has the Android-powered refrigerator, finally. <laughs> yeah, that's just what yeah. you want, isn't it? Phones oh, yeah. that you can drop in the toilet. Yeah. Thanks to Sony. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, in fact, and there were uh, there were there are also a lot of these Android like Roku sticks yeah. that are kind of cool. Yeah, right? mm -hmm. here, yeah, here, a few Google TVs. Here it is. Here's the. Uh, let's see. Is this? Can I play this? The Google Pocket. Are you getting my audio? Because if you don't hear it, it's not going to really be very interesting. So we're in the LG booth, and of course, a lot of people are looking at and amazed by the Ultra HD 4K displays. They've got beautiful OLED displays. I don't know how I'm going to choose from that, but I'll tell you one thing I wouldn't mind having. It's these. This is the Pocket Photo. It will be $200. not available in the U.S. yet. But the idea is you put the Pocket Photo software on your uh, Android phone or your iPhone. Actually, iPhone's Bluetooth. The Android phones, because they support NFC, I could just take this picture and tap it. Can I tap it to one of these? You just I've never seen this printer before in my life. And now I'm printing via the NFC. Actually, I think what it does, I misunderstood it. I think okay, it's doing a Bluetooth with, pairing. Oh, Bluetooth. Now, and then it prints via Bluetooth. Via Bluetooth but it's quite quick. That printer. And it prints the little tiniest thing. It's 200 so bucks. NFC is for Bluetooth pairing. It's kind of a silly little. Uh, oh, that's a little tiny printer. There. It's a little tiny oh, printer. You could carry that in your pocket. I think the market for back. this, because the whole point of easy pairing with NFC is not that you own it, mm -hmm. but that stores have right. it, or it's just you know, it's at yeah. places, and you just right. walk up to it. You took a picture, and you go a bar, for instance, It'd be great. Have it in a bar, doop, and it prints it out. Ease of use. Ease of use. It's the new Polaroid. Yeah. And this is what NFC is probably going to be better for than. Almost anything. You know, yeah. they, the uh, Samsung folks also had NFC tags in the lobby of our hotel. Mm -hmm. So I go, oh, this is exciting. And I go like that. And what does it do? It pulls up a web page for the <laughs> yeah. hotel. You know, it's like, oh. Well, did you hear what Disney's <laughs> doing with, uh, I, I don't know if it's NFC or RFID. Um, wristbands. The wristbands, exactly. Yeah, they're doing wristbands. So you just walk around. No more tickets to the park. Well, it, you know, eventually. then No more tickets to the park. You buy your wristband. You go up. You want to ride a ride. You just scan your wristband. You want, you want to, to buy, buy something. Yep. Buy some candy. Scan your wristband. You know, anything like that. You just well, go ahead. What's really cool about it is, is that with permission, the data will be in there. So when you go up to Sleeping Beauty, uh, Leo, which I know you will, mm -hmm. uh, she'll say, oh, Leo, I haven't no. seen you in ages. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting do you, do you load it with cash is that do you put money yeah. is there like a, you have a balance and then it, mm -hmm. yep wow. and does it do like the fast pass thing on the rides where yep. you'd be like hey i want to yep. ride, ride this ride like notify yeah, me you could, yeah exactly before you get there this is you know gina's doing future research yeah like before <laughs> you get to the park now you could sign up for your fast passes oh and it's that's loaded nice. into your wrist yep mm-hmm that's great. It's a great idea, and it's great for Disney because they get tons more information that way. Um, who's riding what ride, you know, all that kind of stuff. Who's buying what. Um, it, it's a, it's a I, I don't know, Jeff, you can comment on whether that's scary or not. But um, No, you're, 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 you're opting into it all. Right. And so the, you have full control. So the parent can say, you can know my name. I really don't want you to know my kid's name. Whatever. You're in full control, which is, which is great. And what I like about it is that it's, Disney being Disney, it's a little microcosm, perfect world. Mm -hmm. And maybe people will get used to some of the stuff there and say it's not so bad. It's not the mark of the devil. Yep. You know, actually, that ties into uh, Bill Clinton speaking at the Samsung keynote uh, at uh, CES. Samsung uh, had to hold its keynote till Wednesday morning. So they kind of 
So it was uh, it was this morning. President Clinton was uh, kind of like their guest. It's, I mean, it's not Bill Maher or Lady Gaga, but I guess it's okay. He was a president. Uh, but what he talked about was the fact that cell phones, and Samsung is, is one of the leaders in low-end uh, smartphones for the developing world, uh, are a huge and very important part, and this is, of course, something he's very uh, involved in, um, part of uh, the economy of, of developing nations. It, for many uh, people, it's the way they bank. It's the way they make payments. Not NFC, probably. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they're doing it, but, but Android-powered mobile devices are very important. I just read a, a pretty fascinating paper by a Professor Gordon at Northwestern, I'm forgetting his name, in which uh, he, he was arguing about the three industrial revolutions and and the growth that comes as a result of them. So if you can see Look at that. that. It's so a bar is, graph a, on his it's Nexus a bar graph 7. That shows basically, Very that's what's nice. happening to growth, and so it's going to go back down again. So anyway, in this paper, he was arguing that... Um, uh, the toilet and running water, it was a far more important invention for the world right. than, than anything afterwards. But Marcel Bowens, who writes some great stuff online, P2P Foundation, I think it's called, uh, said no, that, that today in certain poor places, people are choosing cell phones over toilets given the choice because the cell phone has an impact on their, their living and, and how much value they get. Yeah, even where they don't have power and they have to go exactly. and rent power you know, there's a guy with a push cart power, and they go and they plug in yeah. because there's no electricity in some of these areas. Yep, It's really remarkable. Uh, other CES events, Pebble says, uh, we're, we're going to ship our Android-powered smartwatch January 23rd. At last. At last. We're all uh, Kickstarter uh, subscribers, are we? Yeah. I'm not. I am. I didn't do Pebble. Pe pe uh, Pebble. Well, that's you what I meant. We, I mean, of course, yeah. we all use Kickstarter. You have to be like... Not in touch with the world, not to use Kickstarter. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you've you've moved to your eBay. You've got an eBay habit now. No, no, what happened was is that Kickstarter fever got to me, so I just sold two of my Kickstarter things on eBay, what? basically for break even, and and got out of them. I had this. I think I've told it in the show before. I had this one thing where you you had a case to an iPhone four and it had a single magnetic card in it, and that could that could mimic all of your credit cards and all right. of your honor. And I realized that was, ah, I'm not going to use that. <laughs> Sold it for a slight loss. And then I just got the first um, uh, heart rate uh, wristband only, no chest band. Oh, this is great. I got to get that. You know, like, like I, I'm taking beta blocks for my heart. I'm not getting my heart rate up. <laughs> and I, I get the thing and I say, it just lands like a thud. I said, oh, shh. Shiza. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I ordered that. So I'm now an eBay, eBay man. So I went on eBay and I sold it for a slight profit. So between the two, I'll break even. And now you're buying stuff on eBay. So it really is a... Well, I'm on eBay, so I bought myself a, <laughs> uh, a Galaxy Note 2 because Leo convinced me I should wow. get it. Now I, I haven't turned it on yet. <laughs> I ordered a uh, I ordered a, a DIY make your own cheese kit like like make your own mozzarella cheese kit right now I I should preface awesome. this by saying that like I'm not really like I, I can I can function in the kitchen like I can make coffee and uh, I can make toast and you know I could put together a dinner but I'm not I'm not exactly a cook well my wife saw this and she just went. <sighs> <laughs> she just sighed. I was like, come on, it's like make your own mozzarella at home. Come on. <laughs> this is on Amazon, right? It's 23 bucks on Amazon. Oh, the... the uh Mozzarella. Is they're that the one you got? No, no, it's a Kickstarter. It's a Kickstarter campaign. It's a Kickstarter, it's, uh, yeah, it's a Kickstarter cheese making oh. kit. Let me see if I can find it. It's probably on my um, profile. Yeah, That's was hysterical. Like, well, I could just I probably it. search for cheese making kit Kickstarter and... Yeah. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> a good idea <laughs> but make cheese incorporated let's make cheese exactly that's it that's in the your one. own kitchen so and guess can... what they've raised thirty nine thousand dollars <laughs> wow. almost 40 grand i can Listen, send you some buttermilk some and some cheese. lemon and some cheesecloth and did you get your kit i haven't gotten the kit yet i got like a they sent like a holiday card saying like hey it's coming i think the i think the mozzarella you one know, ships in like i know what sold you look at this mozzarella making party <laughs> That's what sold you on it. I, this is the thing. Come Look on, at our my cheese. mom's gonna be so impressed. Turn around to eBay right now and put it up there and say that you can order the first cheese making kits. Did you pledge enough to get the mascarpone included? 
<laughs> I didn't. <laughs> just, just straight mozzarella. <laughs> but it does make 30 batches of mozzarella, so it's quite oh, economical. Wow. There are 30 batches. I'm yeah. so excited. My wife was, she was seriously, she was just like, you are never going to do this. I'm like, I am so going to do this. <laughs> I love I'll it. come over. Acid. Let's have a cheese pulling party. party. Maybe on New Year's, I'll make I'll make cheese. Oh, <laughs> in the studio. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good segment. And now, as we approach New Year's in Ghana, <laughs> Gina Trapani will join us to show us how to make cheese. You're like here's some saligny balls. And you I know, think you you, know. you it's like taffy, right? Mozzarella. You got to stretch yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It just looks, yeah. I've never done it. I'm a bad Italian. It's about time. Come on. I want it. That's funny. <laughs> you oh, sorry. Really, sorry for the. I. You really aggression. think all Italians make cheese? No, they go buy it. They have a cheese person. <laughs> I used to make pasta till I realized you could just go buy it. Hey guys, my name's Ella, and I. <laughs> Ella's a cool cheese girl. maker from oh, Calgary. <laughs> That's cool. You know what? This is what Kickstarter is all about. By the way, I should mention that a number of. Uh, Winners at the International Academy of Television for the Web Awards <laughs> were Kickstarter projects originally. They mm -hmm. raised the money, for the financing for the films uh, doing that, including there's a steampunk uh, show. Oh, what's yeah, it called? Film, film is a big thing on Kickstarter. Yeah, everybody loves steampunk. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah, steampunk, of course. All right, well, I'm going to give up one of my numbers right now. Uh, two of them. I've got. Oh boy, it's getting tight here. Um, you don't have okay. to give them up. You don't have no, to no, give no, them no. up. I got it. Got it. Here's here's the number. Uh, this year, Kickstarter, and we're just the beginning of the year, so who knows? Things could change, but it's on track to potentially uh, collect a billion dollars. <sighs> wow. I right. thought I th I was really thinking by now that it would be. Uh, the the, the the Kickstarter bust would have happened, but I guess it it's didn't. down there under the uh, under the stuff on the rundown. You know, if you want to look it up, wow! Uh, I'm just amazed by that. So, just amazed. so Kickstarter, not Kickstarter itself, but but like all of the various Kickstarter yeah, projects of. put together. Yeah, yeah. Kickstarter takes what five percent, something like that. So that's got five yeah. percent of five of a billion. So what is that? Uh, Three hundred fifty thousand dollars. I don't know, uh, Gina. <laughs> what? Am I doing math on demand? But can you do math? <laughs> Gina, can you do math? I'm looking at their their best 2012. Backers pledged $606 per minute in 2012. Yeah. Is that crazy? So the League of Steam, Adventures of the League of Steam was uh, one of the Kickstarter. You love that show? I'm a very good fan of the show. Oh. Oh. These guys raised thirteen grand to do their show. They, I, it's they actually were wearing these costumes, the best costumes ever. They're, it's really cool. And this is your brother's best friend's show, Liz. Wow. Well, he won uh, a number of awards. They kept bringing him up onto stage. Yeah, oh, cool. Oh yeah, I saw this. That's League right. of Steam. I did see this. So that's that's really cool. They built these crazy guns that shoot nets, and God, oh, man, it's amazing. The Adventures of the League of S T E A M. Hmm. Uh, what else? So the Pebble's going to be shipping on the twenty third. So you and I will get ours, Jeff, and we can put it right on eBay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this one I think I'll open. This one I kind of want. No, I have to do a review. I mean, that's why I got it. But uh, it connects to your phone, right? Yeah. Is that, uh huh. There was another one uh, that we tried an Italian design. It was I'm Watch or I am Watch. That was the same idea. It was just horrible. Because, you know, a UI on a watch is not, you know, it's going to be hard to implement well. Yeah. It is tough. So, but the Pebble is e-ink, which I think makes it kind of cool. Uh, what else? Gosh, they're actually, now that I look at it, there's is, there's a lot of stuff. I was watching. Uh, it's CES. Yeah, it's CES. But, but again, it's Android and Samsung, and, and, right. and that's pretty much it. Well, <laughs> a couple of, couple of self-driving cars. You know, I was I was thinking that 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 when HDTV came out, I kind of poo pooed it and said, "Oh, come on, people! We don't kind of programming. People aren't going to buy this stuff." And of course, we an idiot. I can't believe it, right? What do you think about the 4K TVs? Love them, beautiful. What's interesting is the stunning absence of the word 3D <laughs> at mm. CES. For the last two years, there was nothing but 3D at CES, and I guess the television manufacturers are retrenching. I mean, you get it anyway, since most high end TVs have it, but I guess nobody's really demanding 3D TVs. The next thing, which in a way is more realistic than 3D, in fact, not a way, is more realistic than 3D, is 4K, they call it Ultra HD. It's uh, doubled resolution both horizontally and vertically. And there was even an 8K 
no TV. Way. What's wow. that going to do to bandwidth demands on cable? Systems? Well, I asked. You know, I did a, a panel with uh, a guy from Roku and a guy from uh, Sharp, and uh, who were responsible for kind of delivering this content. Uh, and they said we're not worried. I said, but there's, you know, what's interesting is, and this is not unusual, I think, because of uh, Moore's law, that silicon can advance at geometric paces. So, they're, the TVs are getting higher resolution faster yeah. than the demand or the content can mm -hmm. keep up. Right. Uh, but we're still trapped with the telecoms. Uh, I want to. I want to give a quick plug to Susan Crawford, the brilliant Susan Crawford. I uh, was an amazing uh, law professor, uh, was on ICANN, and she wrote a book just out called Captive Audience about the, uh, about the whole issue of us getting national broadband and national fiber uh, using the uh, NBC Universal Comcast merger as a, a, a stepping off point. And, you know, she went on about the, the profit margins for delivering broadband are unbelievably high. And cable systems, she says, now we're just harvesting. They're not investing at all. And Fios has stopped building. It's done deals with Comcast. You know, I, I fear we're going to hit a wall here as a nation where we do have all these great new applications, and we are going to start hitting the wall. But haven't yet. Well, Lloyd Clark, who is director of a uh, new product at uh, Roku, I said, you know, you got to be worried. Because, right, Roku just got to 1080p. It's all delivered. Roku is one of those internet devices that connects your TV uh, to us, among other things, Netflix. Uh, and he said, no, we're not worried. Netflix had a 4K demo. And uh, he said, between improved compression and improved bandwidth, uh, we don't think it's going to be a problem. We think, mm. you'll, we think we will be able to deliver 4K eventually. Wow. Wow is right. Because I tell you, it's like looking through a window. It's awesome. It's hard to imagine. There were a lot of set-top boxes. Let's talk about those. I want to take a break, but let's talk about that and more from CES. Uh, yeah, there were Arcos and a Tom. lot of people. Yeah, and not just Google TV stuff, although right. there is some Google TV uh, news as well. But first, let's talk about my new scale, stamps.com. This is, this is a message to those of you who want to be postal pros. It's a pro tip. If, you, uh, if you're an eBay seller, you got to mail people stuff. If you're an Amazon seller or Etsy, uh, if you uh, are in a business where you send out invoices or uh, mailings of any kind, you know, you know, you probably don't want to go to the post office to buy postage. And maybe you're using a postage meter. There is a much better way. Boy, this is the 21st century for postage. It's called stamps.com. It lets you print postage from your own computer and your own printer. No special ink, no postage meter, no lease. Uh, you just stamps.com. Uh, and uh, and and it's fantastic because it also because you're you know you're on a computer. If, let's say you're a, you're an eBay seller, takes the buyer's information from the page. You don't type it in. It prints out the forms. If it's a express mail or certified mail, it'll send an email to the buyer with the tracking information. All of this automatically. It's very fast, very easy, and the scale is a very nice feature. I'm gonna show you. How I can get this scale for free. This little five pound uh, scale that is USB plugs right into the back of the computer. So you plop the letter, the package on there, and the computer says, okay, this is how much postage you need. Here's what you do. You go to stamps.com right now, and you'll see it. Well, wait a minute now. You see the scale there, but that's the $80 deal. I'm going to get you a better deal. Click the microphone in the upper right-hand corner for the special uh, twig offer. Enter the offer code TWIG. That's all you need. And that $80 offer turns into a $110 bonus offer. You get $55 in postage free over a few months. You get the free digital scale. That's a $50 value. All you do is pay shipping and handling. I think it's four or five bucks. You get a $5 supply kit and a four-week trial of stamps.com. If you are doing a lot of mailing, this is going to be a lifesaver and can even save you a lot of money. Stamps.com. Use the promo code TWIG for $55 of free postage and that beautiful scale. So pretty. It is pretty. It's pretty. I wish I would have done that before we sent out all our Christmas cards. Yeah. You know, it's actually such a good deal. It might be even worth it just for your Christmas card list, although I think it's really not intended for, you know, that kind of mm -hmm. light, light mailing. Um, so let's talk about set-top boxes. Arcos is going to do $150 Android. I'm sorry, not $150. What is the price on that? Cheaper than that. Android 4.1 box. That means it'll have apps. Yes. So this was really cool. This was actually my favorite, uh, best of show for me uh, from CES as far as set-top boxes because it's not Google TV. It's actually Android 4.1.
So that means you get all the app mm. ecosystem that comes with an uh, Android uh, 4.1 system. Mm. And it also has a built-in high-definition camera so that if you want to do things like, you know, hangouts with your family or whatever, you can do that. Um, Arcos has always been a low-price leader with Android. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the camera sits on top of the TV. Yep. And it has a built-in game controller. And the little round discs are supposed to emulate touch on a, like if you were if you were had a tablet or a, or a, or a touch and a full phone. keyboard, QWERTY keyboard on this. Full too. QWERTY keyboard. I mean, it looks really, really good. It's a 1.5 gigahertz uh, multi-core processor, a gig of RAM. You can expand the storage um, by adding an SD card. You can hook up other stuff to it. I mean, I think they've really done a really good job of kind of covering how all do you the compare bases. That, how do you compare that with a Netgear Neo TV Prime, which looked good to me? And then well. Run down. I haven't looked at the Netgear as much. I do have a Vizio CoStar right now. I just got one for review. Uh, the Netgear? Yeah, the Vizio CoStar. Oh, the Vizio CoStar. Yeah, yeah that's we did a review Android, on, right? Mm -hmm. It is. It's, it's Google TV, and I did a review on All About Android You know, several, you several episodes back. It's pretty good. It's a little sluggish. The, the, the thing that I really didn't like about it was the fact that there's no apps. There's right. The Google TV is really limited. Um, uh, software developers are not making apps for no, Google TV. Not. Yeah. So to me, Arcos just kind of like skips that whole bubble of Google TV and just goes right for uh, right for Android 4.1. So did yeah, it's 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 kind of a bad it's bad news for the Google TV team that uh, a manufacturer decided to make a TV device and not not use the operating system that's meant for the TV. But it's true. I mean, that just there are so few Google TV specific apps, um, and the ones that are there are just like oh, classy fireplace. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and the things that you can get anywhere else, you know, right. YouTube, Netflix, right? right? So I, I actually, this is the thing that's most exciting to me about this is that it's full on Android uh, and, and the camera as well. Although I, it seems like there are a lot of Android apps that would just be weird on a TV. I'm well, I, about my, my Android app would I'm, be really weird on a TV. It's, it's, I'm it's, gathering it's a, yeah, it's a uh -huh. tablet, basically. That's why it has the yes. touch knobs. So you would, it okay. would be like having a big tablet. So it'd be like remote controlling a large tablet. Right. Okay. Exactly. So it isn't okay. it isn't a large tablet. It's about the same resolution, actually. It's less a resolution than a Nexus 10, about the same as a Nexus 7. Huh. Mm -hmm. So uh yeah, so it'd just be a big tablet on your in your in your living room. Yep. 100, 129 bucks available next month, according to Arcos. Uh we'll certainly we'll get one to try. Hey, yeah. My living room. Yeah. But there are, I should point out, and have been for a while, a bunch of USB sized sticks right. that's right with android running yep. have you tried any of those um i right. haven't but this is basically taking that same concept to the next level right. right so it's giving you a lot more horsepower um the expandability of adding other devices and other things to it because it's got the ports in the back um so it's basically taking that same concept which is a which is a mini really mini system and saying you know what it doesn't have to be that small let's go ahead and give you a camera give you the things you want give you a nice keyboard and and away you go so i'm going to get one as soon as they come out and uh I'll probably be selling the Vizio CoStar, uh, but we'll see. It will be interesting to see what happens with Roku, Apple TV, and Google TV, uh, because the one thing cord cutters want, they, of course, use these devices to watch on-demand video, mm -hmm. but one thing cord cutters really want is live video. Right. And now Apple TV is doing that with the Wall Street Journal. I have just found out. I didn't even know it. Uh, apparently, Roku doing the same. And uh, according to uh, Vizio's CTO, Matt McRae, in an interview with GigaOM, uh, Google TV will probably be streaming too soon. Yeah. I mean, it already does, but I think b what I got out of this uh, uh, article on GigaOM was you know, they're basically taking the pass-through out. So there's no more pass-through from your cable That's box. That's the thing I like about Google TV, which is it doesn't take up a new HDMI port. Mm -hmm. It's on the same one. It's just an overlay on top of your live television. There, right. He says we're not going to do that anymore. Yeah. So, I mean, it's basically mm. saying, you know, the, the, there's enough cord cutters out there um, that don't really need it. I don't have it. My Vizio CoStar has point. the has the pass through, but I don't use it because I don't have cable. I, I don't use it. Interesting. Mm. I, 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 we're moving so fast in this. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, Inquisitor liked the uh, High Sense Pulse, saying it was the fastest Google TV mm. on the market. High Sense is a, another, uh, uh, I guess, Chinese company that uh, mm -hmm. was off in the South Hall, and I looked at their stuff a little bit. Um, this is really why it's too bad that the that the Google Q thing didn't work because it's such a confusing field and there and it would be nice if there were a touchstone product. Yes. Yeah. That Google yeah. There's had such out an opportunity I, here for someone to do it oh. really, really well and be the clear leader, right? Yeah. 
It's a big ass remote, I gotta say, on this high sense pulse. Um, but you get a full keyboard, you flip it over, you do get a trackpad. Mm -hmm. Another way to handle that touch. Same as the Vizio Coaster. Yeah, you yep, need very a, similar. Yeah, yeah. Although it looks a little bit uh, bulkier. Um, I don't know. It's what all. It, it's almost the same size, I think. But just looking at the it? pictures you're yeah, showing, it's, yeah, it's a little it looks, bigger than your hand. Yeah, that's the same yeah. size as my remote, um, and the box is the same size. Yeah. I wonder. 1080p. Uh, Google Chrome browser, HDMI in and out, USB, IR blaster, mm -hmm. Wi-Fi, DLNA, three AAA batteries. Um, they're proclaiming it as the fastest Google TV on the market. Hmm. Don't know. I don't know. I guess that's coming from Hisense. Uh, LG announced seven models of a Google TV built in. So that's right? more interesting to me. That's more interesting. In fact, and, and was it LG or I guess it was Samsung where you have replaceable software and replaceable modules on the TV, which is a good idea. Yeah, they announced upgrade. that last year. Uh, right. Yeah, the idea being that you don't get, you don't, people don't buy a whole new TV, but maybe they'd want new software or firmware or Ooh, upscalers right. or whatever as the silicon gets smarter. Uh, LG will offer Google TV sets in two series, 42, 47, 50, and 55-inch sets. Uh, and then uh, they'll have the cinema screen in 47 and 55 inches. Hmm. No pricing or availability yet. So this is built into the TV. It's built in. Yeah, they showed yeah. this uh, also last year. They showed Google TV. That's the way it's going to expand, I think, more quickly. is. Yeah. Mm. Uh, the only thing is, I mean, it's it's obsolete. I mean, like we just said, look how fast this is moving. And you buy one of these LG TVs and what happens when they decide not to update it? Right. You know? Yeah. That's why I like the the additional. I mean, it's a kind of a pain to have another box on your, uh, on your entertainment center, but... I, I actually like that because I, I know too. I can throw out that box and get the right. next box when it comes out. Yeah, right. I do too. I'm going to do that more often than I'm going to replace my TV, right? right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Asus Cube is another Did you get Google a look at this, TV. Uh, I, I didn't. Now I'm kicking myself. I went home too soon. 150 bucks launches in March. Same kind of big keyboard remote. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just another Google TV, as far as I can tell. I'm not sure what's uh, different except the, that it's more expensive, and it's a little bigger. It's, and it's got this sort of cubish like uh, skin, uh, you know, mm -hmm. like the or, or the interface to it. It has this is this uh, cube that it it's it's kind of moves around, and each face is a different category. So I think that's why they called it. And so it's say, physically a cube, but also the user interface so. is a cube. Yeah, yeah, it's it's eye candy. Well, the real question is, are they going to start putting higher end processors? Because as you mentioned, right. the sluggishness of some of these things really gets in the way. Yeah, and yeah. if you want, I mean. I love the idea of having it be a true Android experience with a fast processor on right. it. I mean, the reason they're able to do this so cheap is just that. They put in a slower processor but a dedicated video processing chip so that you can do right. things like Netflix and it looks great and right. it's high def and everything. But then you go out and you say, oh, I want to play a game or I want to uh, do something, do some other app on it. And it's like, man, what it's is terrible. going on? It's so slow. So I could play I Angry Birds on my Roku, but it's not what I would prefer or want to do. Right, right. Now, RCA is going the other direction. They're, built, they're, they're delivering a tablet with TV, has two tuners on it. Yeah, I thought this was really interesting. They've... Um, they announced this tablet, and it's it's got two TV tuners, and it and it does a um, it also streams TV. But I, I I just I threw it in here because I wanted to get your opinion, um, this panel's opinion on is this really something that people are interested in doing? This, like this is using Dial D Y L E, which has been mm -hmm. around for a while, and been other uh, solutions like this. Um, I, I think they're, it's a small specialty market. Nothing is... is yeah. Yeah. Remember, I don't remember a couple of years ago, there were all these ads on the Super Bowl and stuff for this. Remember the guy was shopping with his wife, but he got to watch TV. Right. Similar right. technology, mm. never went anywhere. I yeah. can't remember the no. name of it. But uh, Verizon was had that uh, and Verizon service. has Vcast. Yeah. They still the have Vcast, Vcast yeah. So uh, it's got the dial TV, and then I think it also has a... a the other tuner is the over-the-air tuner, so... You know, theoretically, you could be sitting in the airport or in a taxi cab or, or something and... Watching the game. Watching the game from there, but I, I just don't know. Uses 4G, uses a kind of a off... What is it, Metro PCS 4G? It's, a, mm -hmm. it's, not, a, it's not a major player. Right, that's which right. Which means it won't be everywhere. Interesting, but I just don't know how many they'll sell. Android cameras. Uh, Samsung had one. Full Android on the back. Regular point-and-shoot camera on the front. Polaroid has one with interchangeable lenses. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool because that's what people were complaining about with the Samsung one. Um, is if you well, there's a point and shoot. It's a point and shoot camera, exactly, and people wanted something a little bit higher end. And this, so this looks is like Micro it's Four Thirds. Be this is the mirrorless, very popular. Nice thing about Micro Four Thirds is a standard uh, lens design. So even if Polaroid only makes one, you can get uh, Micro Four Third lenses from a number of manufacturers. Mm -hmm. 
Android 4.1, that's good. I'm glad we're seeing that everywhere Yes, now. yes. Yeah. For a while, it was gingerbread still on some of these things. I'm not sure what's on the Samsung camera. I think it's 4.0. Four, it it's, it's at least 4.0. Oh, yeah. Um, when it came four, out. 4.99.99 for the uh, Galaxy camera. 500 bucks. Uh, yeah, oh, Android 4.1 oh, Jelly Bean, 4.8-inch LCD touchscreen, mm -hmm. quad-core processor. You know, I was talking, uh, we did a triangulation uh, with uh, a guy from Nokia, Hans-Peter Brodmo. Hmm. Uh, and uh, he's a camera buff, a photography buff, uh, but also kind of a R and d blue sky guy for Nokia. And he says that really the future of photography is, uh, is not in lenses, it's in uh, computation, hmm. back-end computation. You, st you see this with things like the Lytro camera where you take a picture, right. uh, but you get to focus on a variety of different planes. He says computation is going to be huge... And you see it already in kind of a small form with the Android, even iPhone, mm -hmm. where you get you take a picture, but you have all these programs, the least of which Instagram filters, but all sorts of other things you can do this stuff process afterwards. Uh, so the idea of putting an operating system, powerful processor uh, in a camera, I think, is, a, is really intriguing. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's the sharing thing, especially now. I'm just I just take a lot more pictures because my daughter's so little, right. and you know, doing it with my phone, I get a low quality, relatively low quality photo, but I can automatically send it to Flickr, right? But if I take it with the nice DSLR, I mean, even if you have an iFi, it's still fiddly, and you have to connect to the thing. To, you right. know, so like being able to take a good picture and then send it directly, you know, to Flickr from a good camera, uh, you you know, because it's got. Android on it is is appealing. Yeah, if if we got to the point on, but it comes down to telecom companies once again. Even the shared data plans that have come out, you have to pay for every device, and they still limit it too much. It's like the days when the telephone company charged you for how many phones you had, which was absurd. But that's the way it worked. If you got to the point where you just said, "Listen, I'm going to have as many devices as I want," and yeah, you're going to charge me if I use more data. At that point, I'd say okay, because then I can have my Android. Mm -hmm. camera and my Android refrigerator and my Android car and my Android this and my Android that, and I'd be all happy. But now the the, the, the plans are just too gating. Yeah. Uh, Valve Steambox. See, I'm thinking that games are actually the killer app for even something like Google TV. That's yeah. why I want Android, because I want to play games and do TV, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Uh, and this, the idea of the Steam Box is it's basically uh, using Valve's Steam platform, which is a very powerful, very popular gaming platform on PCs, and making a small box, roughly the cost of, say, a PlayStation 3, that, that, that sits in the living room and runs, interestingly, Linux, not, right. not Windows. Yeah, Steam introduced uh, their Linux, uh, their client for Linux, not too long ago. They had a beta, closed beta. Now they have an open beta. You can actually go download it. And, I, and if, if you have Windows, I think we're Mac, you can also see it. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of sit-back experience with Steam, and it's great. Yeah, it's the a, big screen, they call it's it. It's great. Yeah, yeah. And so this is really interesting that they are um, actually getting into hardware now. Um, it looks like they want to compete with the Xboxes and PS3s of the world. Um, and why not? I mean, they have a huge following on PC. Um, I'm seeing people now go back to PC, away from consoles. Um, but there are there is this group that loves to be in the living room with a traditional controller. And so there's been rumors floating around for forever that they're going to do a piece of hardware so people can play in their living rooms without having to do the PC thing. And, and now it looks like they're doing it. So Valve is showing off uh, Piston, which is one of, they say, many prototypes. This, look at that. That's cool. Yeah, That's based cool on an actual uh, gaming PC this company sells. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's really cool looking. Thousand dollars for the gaming. PC look at the version. look at the back. The, yeah, the, look at the back. Scroll. I was like, oh. Yeah. Is there a uh, shiny? I don't see a back. Uh, I'm looking ooh, at the wrong a of, article. A lot of ports. <laughs> here's here's Don't some more. Ports. Here's some more pictures. Oh, there you it's go. It's very pretty. Look at ooh, the back. four <laughs> USB ports. Uh, ESATA, ESATA. A couple of ESATA ports. Uh, HDMI, USB, HDMI, USB 3.0, and then two like mini video. Um, what are those? Thing? Yeah. Isn't that the mini video format? Oh, uh, yeah. The Apple, yeah. Same thing that you use mini on a Display Mac, right? port, yeah. yeah. E old Ethernet Ooh, port. A couple of yep. Display ports. <laughs> e, Ethernet, old e old Ethernet. Ethernet. <laughs> Ethernet. <laughs> yeah, it really does look like it's a kind of a <laughs> throwback. That's the throwback port. Wow. That's when you need a, a stable connection, kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it looks like they're shopping this around. I mean, this particular box we're looking at here. Um, retails at a thousand dollars. Yeah, I don't think that that's that's um, not the price. Point. That's not where that's going to get. Although into... there'll be a market for that, the hard the hardcore PC gamer mm -hmm. will say, "Hey, great, I don't care, I, but because I want to play my PC games in my living room on my big screen TV." 
Maybe that's the high end. That's the high end. Yeah, maybe that's the high end, and they'll have something at like one ninety nine, hopefully. Well, they sh- it's got to be PlayStation and priced, I think. Maybe not. One ninety nine, two ninety nine, three ninety nine. Yep. Four ninety nine. <laughs> <laughs> we could go on. <sighs> okay, let's take a break. Come back with more. There is lots more. In mm. fact, I think we buried the lead. Uh, you would agree, Jeff Jarvis. Oh, yeah, we'll get there. We had to geek out. That's fine. We had to gadget out. See right. stuff, but we come we back. We are. Google wins. Okay, but first, a <laughs> word from Ting. Ting's the thing. If you're an Android fan, you got to find out about Ting. It's a new mobile phone service from the folks at Two Cows who specialize. I love this Elliot Noss of Two Cows. Uh, he did, uh, he, they do Hover.com. They specialize in taking industries that are just really suck and making them work for people, making them better. He says, this is, there's a huge opportunity to take cell phone service, which is universally hated, and make it work for people. And you start off with, you know, integrity. You know, telling people there's, there's what you're going to pay exactly. Uh, no BS. Contract free. No early termination fee. Uh, you don't. They don't bundle or give you ride-along services. In fact, if you go to Ting, T, I'm sorry, Twig, dot Ting dot com, T I N G, uh, you can uh, see. First of all, we'll get you a twenty-five dollar uh, credit to get you started on your first device. But you can also see how it works. Look at the plans. Now, this is just a serving suggestion, but I'll give you an idea of how this is going to save you money. First of all, it's great if you are a family uh, or a business and you want multiple handsets. It's six dollars per handset. Per month, so let's say it's a you know say it's family of four. That's twenty four bucks. That's your cost. But then you'll add minutes. Now you you could start with zero of everything, and just pay as you go. Or you could say you know just to kind of budget. I'm going to use a thousand minutes shared, two thousand text messages shared, and uh, let's make it three gigabytes of data shared. And the total cost one hundred ten dollars for the family of four a month, for four people one hundred ten bucks a month. And the best part is you don't use all of that. They rebate you the difference. You use more, no penalties. They just charge you the next level up. You pay for just what you use. You get credit on unused service. There are no add-on charges. What do you get for free? Voicemail, picture and voice messaging, three-way calling, caller ID, but I know the one you're looking for and they have, tethering and hotspot included. No additional charge, no mysterious line items. Unlimited devices on any plan, just six bucks a month per handset. Uh, and you'll like the online, con you know, this is it's a service for geeks. So you'll like the online control panel that lets you see exactly what's going on. Uh, great support, great price, and never any early termination for your contracts. Go to twig.ting.com to save 25 bucks on your first device. If you want to see what the customer support looks like, help.ting.com, you'll see the forums, help ticketing system, video tutorials, video startup guides, and more. You start by picking your device, and of course, they have lots and lots of uh, devices for you, um, including the Note 2, including um, the S3. It's good. It's a good Android experience, the Nexus. Lots of good choices, and LTE, because it's riding on the Sprint network. Very good prices, very good service. This is the, there's the Optimus G, which is really, that's the Nexus 4 mm. um, with LTE. Stuff like that. Uh, take a take a look. Twig. Ting. T i n g. Dot com. I'm not gonna show. I won't show uh, Jeff the price on the Galaxy Note Two. We'll just pretend he didn't see that. <laughs> <laughs> didn't see that. Uh, moving right along. So uh, Google off the hook. According to the FTC, they are not a monopoly. Uh, it's okay what they're doing with. Uh, uh, they don't favor their own results in search. Some say this wasn't a victory for Google. There are a few little caveats and requirements. Yeah. I think this is a huge victory, don't you, Jeff? I think it's I think it's a gigantic victory. I think it's a really heartening victory um, that uh, you know they spent a long time, two years, looking into supposed uh, violations, and in the end, said Google had the right to uh, put up. Uh, direct content on its search results and said that there was no harm to consumers in this and that there's no harm to advertisers in this. That's the, that's the part that people are, are, are complaining about actually more. Yeah. Um, and, but, and Yelp, Yelped! 
<laughs> well, and, and Yelp, and Yelp but, but Google said, Yelp, you don't want to be part of it. They specifically, there's a specific way now they agreed to so that if Yelp doesn't want to be scraped for, for any reviews, they don't have to be. Though I think it's suicidal Yelp, but fine. If that's what you want, Yelp, that's fine. Move to Belgium and Germany and France and uh, Leistungsschutzrecht for you. Um, uh, <laughs> the, the other part of it was the, 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 the basic patents, but that was really more about Motorola's era than Google's era, as I understand it. And, and Google said, fine, we're going to open up all the patents. They've dropped some patent suits. I only wish that were the beginning of a truce in patents. I, I fear, you know, I, I'm told it's not. Uh, but it was very clear statement uh, saying to Google and uh, the rest that Google was not, was, was helping consumers with what it does and that this was not antitrust, it was not monopoly, and I think it's a big, big victory, not just for Google, but for the net and for innovation. And part of the argument was, things change so quickly. And this is the big revelation from the Microsoft re uh, efforts before, of course, is that by the time they got around to finally finishing decrees on Microsoft, Microsoft was already uh, bottom of the heap again. And, and there's all kinds of changes in technology and Google's saying, you know, there's all kinds of new markets here where we weren't even in them before and, you know, we're going to fight with everybody else. And, and so I'm, I'm very happy about this, this agreement. And I think it's, um, yeah, what, what the only thing that pissed me off was the Wall Street Journal continues its anti-Google bias. Mm -hmm. and acted as if they, you know, escaped and barely got off. No, the FTC was very clear in saying that Google was not monopolistic and was not violating antitrust in its actions. They also said, and Ron Wyden uh, agreed, that uh, there is no barrier to entry to getting into right. search. I don't know if that's true, is it? <laughs> well, but the part of the problem here is that search is yesterday's battle. That's not So nobody about. cares, right. But so we, we've been saying that in this show for, for two years ourselves, since all right. this started. That, uh, uh, yeah, so fine. Microsoft went all this effort to start Bing. Okay, what next? You know, fighting yesterday's battle is foolish, where now Google says, yeah, 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 we got search, and yeah, it's bringing in billions of dollars. But what we were really concerned about now is mobile. And, and that's where the company's headed. What we're really concerned about now is relationships with people, uh, otherwise known as social, and data about that, and trying to figure out that stuff. So search is, is you know, uh, an old battle. Now, this is not to say that they couldn't get zapped in Europe, and I could see Europe going two ways. Europe could say, oh, well, this could kind of make us look bad. Or Europe could say, well, if the Yanks won't get their own darn company, we're going to show them, which I fear may be the case. But we'll see what happens. Interesting, too, that Google increased greatly its spending on lobbying. It, it uh, paid a lot of attention to this. Uh, every account said that they treated it very seriously and they, they were walking through the Justice Department. They did not want to have a Microsoft-like snotty attitude. Schmidt went and paid homage a lot and, and sat down with conversations with them. And they tried to work this out and explain to them the rationale of what they were doing and why they were doing it to benefit us. Jeff, do you think this was a misfire on FTC's part? I mean, do you think that they... They shouldn't have done it in the first place? Right. I mean, it almost feels like, and of course I'm reading between the lines here, it almost feels like someone got a burr under their saddle. They heard something, Google's doing such and such, and they're like... <gasps> I can't believe it. Let's go. No, I think it's the other. I think what happened is Microsoft, Yelp, and other companies, and there's a pretty long laundry list of companies involved in this, uh, rattled the cage and said, "FTC, you got to, we got to look into this." In fact, they mm -hmm. were very unhappy with the result. And it's, it's I mean, you could also interpret it as anti-competitive from those guys. Although, here's one thing that Google did do that they had to change. You know, when Yelp went to them at first, it said, "We don't want Yelp reviews in the places listings. That's your stuff. We don't want to be there." We want people to come to Yelp to find out what our Yelp reviews are. Google said, oh, you could do that, but you got to take Yelp out of all Google search results. And that is kind of anti-competitive. Mm -hmm. that's, that's using a big stick saying, well, okay, right. but then you're, you can't find Yelp anywhere on the web. Right. And, the, and the, part of this decision was, no, and Google has added now this feature to take it out of places without taking it off of Google search. I think, that, you know, they've done the same thing in news, and so I think that they'll, they'll, they'll do the same. No, I, it's a really good question, Aaron. Uh, I, I think Leo's right. Microsoft and company spent a lot of money, hired a lot of lobbyists, uh, did a lot of advertising, created a lot of fake trade organizations to go against Google in this case. Fairsearch.org. And, and uh, so the FTC, I guess, you know, had to look into it in one way or another. Um, and I thought it was going to go against Google just because that's the that was the mood and that's kind of what Leibovitz was heading to. But I really take my hat off to him that um, they, I think, delivered a very fair decree here. Uh, Tim Wu from Columbia, who was consulting to the FCC, FTC for a period during this process, wrote a really good piece, a couple of really good pieces, 
uh, talking about this and saying that, no, they didn't escape uh, you know, with their skin. This was a good decision. It was a right decision. Uh, and I think that's the case. In fact, it might have been a pretty surprisingly smart decision for them to understand that uh, it wasn't about search anymore. Yeah. Because, I mean, as you said, the Microsoft prosecution took so long that it was kind of meaningless by the time it was done. What the FTC wants is competition, and we do have competition. Again, right. the one area where we don't truly is advertising. Um, yeah, I can go and find, well, well, you know, but even there, there's all kinds of I new... I don't know. There's Google, there's Facebook, there's... I think there's... there's so there, the, even there there is, but Google has more power there than it does anywhere else in terms of its market share. It's not a search market share, it's an advertising market share that, that bears is, more. Is, is it really Google that dominant uh, when you took, look at Bing and Yahoo and Facebook and, and, and Google that they're, they're, they're so much bigger than everybody else? Is that true? Yeah, the, the share they have of online advertising is gigantic. But again, there, there's new innovation. So there's new real-time marketplaces for buying people as they go around the web. Uh, that go around Google. Um, there's mobile stuff coming up like crazy. So that's another example where even though Google does have incredible power, it's by no means invincible. Google also, and I think this is a, a positive uh, result of this uh, suit, said it's not going to use its uh, patents um, uh, to, uh, to stop uh, competitors. Well, this was, yeah, I mean, this was one of the stipulations of the agreement, right? So so Google and Motorola said that they'd stop, uh, the stipulation was that they will cease seeking product bans for standards, essential patent infringement, and that they would resolve those disputes in arbitration and not in court. So it was part of this agreement, which is a good thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it, that's also the, res that's also the, uh, so there's good outcomes to mm -hmm. this. In other words, I don't think the FTC uh, did anything wrong. They, they, they investigated and they got some concessions from Google. That are good mm -hmm. for good all around. I think that the, this probably was something that needed to be done. Yeah, although Google is the one who says that they don't use patents offensively. Yeah. Uh, but but this was for Google Motorola. That was right. Motorola, exactly. Right. Yeah, that was about Motorola, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Patents lawsuits by proxy. Um. What else? Where 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 should we? You put so many stories in here, Aaron. I don't know where to go next. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't. Who's been? Who's been jamming our rundown with stories? There's about a million things to talk about here. This is crazy. Here you got you got Eric. Let's give you a choice here. Eric Schmidt in North Korea. Uh, Brad Feld talking about Google Plus as the long game. Uh, Google creating free Wi-Fi in Chelsea. Um, I love that boy. That's New York City. Yep, that's New York yes. City. Yeah. Why, why is this the next stage in the Google Fiber rollout? Is uh, is Google going to put uh, internet everywhere? They did a press conference with um, Bloomberg. But again, I, I was at a, an event last night with Susan Crawford's book, um, Captive Audience, give it a plug. Uh, and, and she warns not to, not to get too happy about free Wi-Fi, that, that what we really need, the only thing that's going to work is fiber mm -hmm. to the house. Right. That's all that really matters. But nonetheless, uh, let's take it. And uh, I think it's a great thing. But, of course, that's the neighborhood in New York where Google is uh, in Chelsea. They're on 8th Avenue. Oh, right? okay. So they're right. just being a good neighbor. They're being a good neighbor. And I forget the number of, you know, 200,000 uh, residents around. Uh, and I don't know how good it'll be in your house. Right. Uh, but what it also means is that Chelsea is Google's campus. So if you're a mm. Google and out and around the same way you are in Mountain View, you're going to, you know, there's free Wi-Fi. What I love when I go visit Mountain View is there's no restrictions. There's no signing in. There's no agreeing to anything. You're just on the Wi-Fi. Thank you very much, Google. And that they've done the same thing in their, in their Chelsea campus, kind of. And what Brad's writing about is the brilliant long game of Google Plus is really just a special example of what others have written about, which is that Google, Google, others have said, for instance, that Google's a Trojan horse on iOS. Yeah. And we've all observed that we're not using Apple Apps on iOS anymore. For in many cases, we're using Google Maps, Google Calendar, Google Address Book, uh, and uh, and not using the Apple applications. Um, and uh, he he points out, Brad points out uh, that he lives in Gmail. I do too. We all do. I think mm -hmm. Google Voice is his phone number. Me too. Yep. He says Google Hangouts is my new calendar invite. I haven't gotten to that point yet. Yeah, um, that's where I, I break from this. Yeah, yeah I don't understand yeah. that at all, in fact. But that may, I don't invite anybody to anything anyway. Uh, communities has been big for us. Jeff set up a Twig community that is really the best community we've got, much better than our own communities. Mm. 
think they were really you know, good and taken off. And I, I need to be even more often too. Man, because it, it, we have a, it'd be nice if, if we use those communities to also get story ideas and things like that. Because folks, remember the other thing is I always forget to put up the um, replay of the show, and one of the users just puts it up every week. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great. Uh, how how is I guess I could just search for it in plus.google.com. I'm a member, so I'm probably not getting the same result as a normal person. You, or you, go to communities and then search from there. So the community go into the communities sidebar. first and then search. And then you can search. Okay. Or you can see your communities and you can search. Right, right. Um, yeah, I need to be more involved here as well. We've got 2,871 members. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it really yeah. is. And uh, Jeff, you haven't set up any discussions, have you? have it because i don't know uh, what i should do there because in one sense it's nice to have one discussion some people are coming after me saying well you should set up different discussions um uh, i don't know the idea of uh, discussions make it kind of look like an online forum right. where you have mm -hmm. you know um i think we'd have to do that if we wanted story suggestions for instance you'd have a discussion group that says story suggestions you might even have a subgroup or, or a group that says story suggestions for the week of i don't know how, how you would do it but i think you want some standards across the twit network and and lisa had me oh. bear there as a, a moderator so i think that if if you know if he came along and said listen this is that we ought to have this standard discussion in every twit show so that one of your producers comes in knows where to look i don't think idea. bears are going to do that maybe glenn will do that we'll figure that out i don't i don't you know see my initial reaction was that a thousand flowers bloom let 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 each host and each producer do whatever they want with their show and 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 have it be organic. I don't know if we need it. I don't. I don't say we have. What's the twit standard for discussion groups? I don't think. I think every show should do what they want to do. It's boss. Don't you? That's great. Yeah. Because different things work for different shows. Right. I mean, like for example, for TNT, Reddit seems to be working pretty well, where people can vote on stories and bring right. them up to the top. That's yeah, they're a using a, a subreddit that works great. Mm -hmm. Yep. In I fact, I wanted to do that, and that's never got around to it. Uh, anyway, Brad, I think, uh, is saying that the Google long game is brilliant. I'm not sure brilliant's the right word, but it's clear they are playing the long game, and they are, they are and it seems they, to be working for them. Right. And, and nobody's giving them credit to think that there's actually something here, and what oh, I mean, they're, they're sticking to it. There was another piece in the Atlantic today that said, listen, Google kills the things that don't work. Right. And it ain't killing Google+, Plus, and it's only growing, and um, uh, I won't steal my number this time because I've run out of numbers, but, but when we get to the end of the show... Um, we're talking about how news sites are using Google Plus in surprisingly good ways. I there's a lot there, and I I really enjoy doing it. I did a post this last week. Amanda Palmer, who I'd like to have on the show, by the way. Deal. You know Amanda Palmer. Yes. She's she's just great. I did a I did a, an economist event with her, and she was wonderful. And and I loved I, her blog post. It was just amazing. Yeah, and I I wrote about that too, and uh, uh, it was fascinating to see what happened to the conversation. So I put the same post just to see what would happen on my blog on uh, Google+, Plus, on Medium, which is Ev's new new thing, and on Huffington Post. And um, apart from it suddenly getting spammed badly, 300 posts I had to take out with odd South Asian names oh. saying, yeah, yeah, uh, pretty. Um, <laughs> but it was, uh, 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 you know, and this horribly, it's about, it's about a, a, a teenager's suicide. It's an awful thing to have to go through and see people so off, off key. But... Yeah. For that, the discussion on 100 posts on, on Google Plus was really good. Um, the discussion on Amanda's blog, by the way, is unbelievable. Just, yeah. just, just incredible. She, um, there's there's a, it's three parts now. She started uh, it with On Internet Hatred, uh, and it was about bullying, and it's very powerful, and about her experience, and, of course, about this sad story of the teenager who uh, commit, committed suicide after making a YouTube video yep. about being bullied online. It was just uh, wrenching, gut-wrenching. Really, really is. <sighs> I couldn't watch the video. I, I, I no, I, I, I did, and it was absolutely wrenching. Uh, and somebody, one person gave me hell in Google Plus that, you know, and I, 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 I've been waiting for the moment to write about that time when you see on Twitter somebody disagrees with somebody else, and then somebody else comes in on Twitter and says, "Fight, fight." <sighs> And, and it, it really has upset me, and I was waiting for that moment to see it again because I want to say we're making the internet, you know, we're, we're getting the internet that we build. And is this the, the internet you really want to build? Right. That's what you're encouraging. Every time you do that, every time you, see, you point to something and encourage it, you're going to get more of it. And every time you don't discourage it, when you know something, somebody's giving ad hominem attacks to someone who doesn't, uh, has no 
need to suffer it, then you're also uh, allowing it and encouraging it. And it's time we've got to rethink the, the internet we're building and the society that we're building here. So I wanted to write about that too. She wanted to write about that because she had a bunch of controversy in how she did her last tour with musicians. So she started to search on Amanda and hate because uh. her own name is Summer. What she found instead was this gut-wrenching, horrible story of this teenager who just had had, had fallen deeper and deeper into bullying uh, in school after school after school. And neither of us was trying to make any comparison of ourselves to that, not by any means. But we were coming along trying to talk about it in this way, and then you, you know we just saw this, this doorway to a society that we don't want in this world. And it's up to us. You find in, Fran in, in, in England right now, the government has arrested people for tweets because they're mean or nasty, for, for, for example, burning a poppy, uh, protesting soldiers. In France, you have a government minister who's coming after Twitter and saying that, that Twitter should um, cooperate with efforts to ban negative speech. Uh, Glenn Greenwald wrote a great piece about this, and I, I or was it Glenn? It was somebody else. But I, I agree very much that, that that's very dangerous for government to get into this. That's government affecting speech. And by the way, it's not government's role. It's our role. It's our society. And if we don't do something about this, uh, then we're going to keep on getting more of what of what we encourage in the infantile early stages of the net. And I'll take full responsibility. I've been involved in some nastiness. I've said things. I regret it now. Uh, what I said in my post is it's like the, the when the substitute leaves the class and we all start doing spitballs. Yeah. That's what the end is like early on. But it's not now. And we've got to, we've got to build the society of ours. So sorry for my... No, salute. well said. And it's something that needs to be said. And, and uh, read Amanda Palmer's uh, blog post. Start at the first one and go through the three. Um, oh, what's the name of your blog post about this, Jeff? Uh, we get the net and society we build. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Cool. True. It's true. By the way, I got a lot of response on Medium, which is, again, is Ed Williams. Uh, uh, oh, interesting. Really, really elegant, wonderful interface for putting stuff in. You just, you just put the stuff in there. When you mark a word, you have five choices above. Easy to put a photo in. It sizes automatically. It's elegant and beautiful. It has no comments yet. They're going to add that. Uh, Ev hired my my ex agent Kate Lee, who's wonderful to be the head of content for it. But but I got a, I just saw a lot. Even though there's no comments, I saw a lot of people noticing it on Medium and coming across on Twitter, uh, marking it. It's a it's a beautiful platform. So you ha it, currently you have to uh, request an invitation to post content there. Oh uh, yeah, for a bit. And you po and you post uh, you post content as a, as basically as an article. Uh, yeah, if you go, if you scroll down, you'll see mine. Uh, that's what it looks like. Uh, I think on the right. No, not there anymore. It's really, really uh, kind of. Uh, yeah, there it is. It, it, on the left. Yeah, we get the net and society we build. Beautiful, simple interface. Um, He's kind of doing a, a, t a long form Tumblr, a Tumblr for words, maybe. Also hired somebody to be in charge of content. He's trying to bring in, you know, quality content like and it. and try to, you know, raise it up. A and then B because there's collections in there that that piece is in a kind of just I a -E. H O <laughs> one of the restaurants that I contributed to with a chapter from my book um, and uh, so so there's a collaboration to it not in the individual pieces but in the idea of collecting things. Oh, this is great. That's it's quite nice. He's making a magazine, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and as and as Evs want, he's getting all of you guys to do the work. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Philip Definitely. Kaplan Pud, who created the EFT company, once told me, he said, the best kind of internet company is one where everybody else does the content. You just sit there and collect the money. True. Yep. Best in terms of revenue. I yeah, guess. for best for him. Right. Yeah, yeah. Although I like this medium. Well, maybe they'll maybe they'll let me write something for them. I could not believe the use of hashtags at CES is so out of control. You'd go to a booth. And the first thing they'd say is, tweet this, tweet this, use the hashtag Ford or whatever. And it was oh, like... I would, I would last about five minutes. <laughs> At the uh, International Academy of Television on the Web Awards, they had, you know, you got to have a hashtag. I felt like, God, I'm, you know, even Seinfeld has a hashtag, retro, it's got a, re I'm going to call it a retro tag. Uh, we, why don't we have a hashtag twit here? Because I think it's stupid. <laughs> That's why. Even Newsweek, its last issue of the year, you know, the last print issue, the last time they had an issue in print, hashed right in the front, the cover, last print issue. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> it's out of control. This is why I do a show on your network, Leo. I'm not going to do that.
You and me. You and me. We're on the same uh, same page. Well, okay, <laughs> well, I tell me stupid. why. I think it's stupid, but why? <laughs> why is it stupid? Uh, yeah, I, got, I wouldn't have lasted five minutes to see yes if, if people are yelling, tweet, using this hashtag. Every single booth. Why is it stupid? Why is it stupid? Well, because if you want to talk about something, you'll talk about it right. and people will find it. Like it just it right. feels so crazy uh, self-promotional. It doesn't. It actually doesn't bother me on TV shows. Like when you have the, the watermark in the bottom, I actually don't mind that. It's like, okay, you know, I'll see what people are saying about this. But yeah, Twit, Twit doesn't need that. People are already talking about Twit. Yeah, people we'll let, let you have the, have the conversation you want with the hashtag you choose. The hashtag yeah. of your choice. I bring it up because the American Dialect Society has declared that 2012, the word of the year 2012 was hashtag, beating out YOLO, Fiscal Cliff, and Gangnam Style. <laughs> I wonder if Chris Messina popped a bottle of champagne. He invented the hashtag. He invented the term, didn't he? And there was a baby named hashtag last year, right? <laughs> <laughs> that poor kid. <laughs> no, no, not one of the Romney kids. Go Look up Richard Gingras on uh, Google+. Plus. G I N G R A S. He's the head of Google News, mm -hmm. and you can see a couple pictures down. He burned a hashtag on the beach for New Year's. <laughs> <laughs> Is it the hashtag backlash? Fire of the hashtags. <laughs> That's a good hashtag. Hashtag backlash. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I I guess it's so damn self promotional. Yeah. That it well, bothers me, and it's you're right. It's attempt to f mold the conversation instead of letting people have their own thought. I mean, we all do some self-promotion. It just, it feels like just let your audience talk about right. your product the way they want to talk about it. Right. But it's a, it's a hint. Here's a helpful serving suggestion. Use the hashtag twig. Uh, see, I, you know what? Mostly it's because I have a, 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 a constitutional aversion to marketing of any kind. Mm. You know, it doesn't bother me if someone's trying to start a movement on Twitter and says, you know, use yeah, this Arab hashtag. Spring or whatever. Right. Yeah, right. So we are square. Like, that makes sense. That's different. That makes sense. But yeah, that's a lot different than the CES booth uh, babe. Were there booth babes at CES? Oh yes. Oh, I, this sounds just. This sounds like my personal hell. Uh. <laughs> I don't know. You should have seen some of these booth babes. <laughs> no, it's it's funny. Uh, we got there. Uh, I had to get there early on uh, Tuesday. At, at the show opens at ten. So, but I had to get there at nine because we had to uh, meet somebody. And that's when all the women, the young, attractive, high-heeled, short-skirted, heavily made-up, work, heavily quaffed women arrive. Uh, and it was I was watching, and you know, so these beautiful women all show up, and then their coordinator, who's also an invariably another woman, an older, high-heeled, mini-skirted, well-quaffed, made-up woman, gives them their uniforms, the mini-skirts, <laughs> hands them out, so they all look the same, right? Because then now you know you're with Booth. Hashtag. Fembots. Fembots. <laughs> yeah, they look like fembots. Totally. Totally. And it's so retro. There was a time briefly when this was not done, right? And now it's back big, oh, back in spades. But so I, the same with Vegas. Remember Vegas was supposed to be a family place for a while? Yeah. And now we were staying at the Rio. They've got a topless pool. They've got go-go dancers. <laughs> and as you enter the door... <laughs> the first time, the first time I went to Vegas and saw like some, a stripper like in the lobby of the hotel, which I was just like, whoa! I was like, can we? I want to buy her a sandwich and like wrap her in a blanket. Like that was my, <laughs> that was my. <laughs> like, can we get her a hero? Is there like a meatball Poor hero girl. nearby? Like, let's sit her down and like feed her and talk to her about her life choices. Sorry, no judgment. I'm. Uh, no, it's not a judgment. It's just it <laughs> doesn't. It seems I don't know. It's not what I, it's not the tech community that we wanted to build, is it? No. Well, that's the problem with Vegas. Yeah, you have. I always tell foreigners that you haven't seen how low America can go until you go to Vegas. You know, it's sad, and uh, we see a lot of people visiting from Australia and Scandinavia and all over the world. They come to the Brick House, and invariably they go to Vegas. It's like mm -hmm. you can't come to America without visiting Vegas. And for the <sighs> first time, I met a couple uh, visiting from overseas who uh, I said, "Are you going to Vegas?" They said, "No, we're going to Napa." <laughs> I said, yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. We host uh, Japanese students occasionally. Well, two or three a year we host for a week or so at a time. And without all of them, without fail, have been to Vegas. They usually go to Vegas first, and then they come to see us, and they're, like, bored out of their mind, right? But Yeah, they think Amer I think they think America is Vegas. And you know what? They might be right. That's the, that's the depressing thing. Let's hope not. I, I can't wait to get out of there. Every time I go there, it's like, ah, ah. 
Two days was all I could take this year. Um, and, but it's the only, and the reason the CES is there probably because there's a, a infinite supply of booth babes, but also because as they say it's the only place big enough. And in fact, mm -hmm. CES, despite everything I've said negative about it, was bigger than ever this year. 150,000 people. They had to expand into the Venetian as well as the Las Vegas Convention Center, which itself is massive, mm. massive. Um, I think we should take a break and come back with our tool tip and number. Jeff still has before Jeff loses his last one. Of, oh my God, that's why I stock them up. I, I hoard them. <laughs> it shouldn't be hard. Um, you know, it's weird. It's week to week. Sometimes it's easy as pie and sometimes there's just no numbers to be had. Yeah. It's like that for tips too. Some weeks are yes. yep. mm -hmm. too many and then others, it's like I'm scrambling right before the show. Yes. There's one story I'd like to hit. Okay, yeah, okay. I'll give you each a chance to pick one story that we haven't mentioned. So so Target is going to match Amazon's prices now for online. Yes. Right? They don't um, want to be they don't want to be Amazon's showroom anymore. So they want you to go ahead and buy it. What does that do to Target? It's good for Target, right? No. I think it is because then you then you don't leave the store, right? I mean, the, the longer the they can keep people in the store buying their stuff, even if they have to give them a little bit of a discount, they're going to buy toilet paper and paper towels and all this other stuff while they're there. The, I mean, I, the, the problem right now is that people go to Target and they say, show me your TVs. Which one do you like? Da, da, da. Says, Thank you very much. And then they go buy it on Amazon. Showrooming. On, the, on their Amazon thing, which is what I do in the bookstore. Right. Uh, but, right, number there's an obvious impact on profitability. Uh, and, and second... Um, and, and then instead of on TV, as they were doing the report, you know, you kind of know, you know, the target has always given you two prices. So there's the price on the shelf, uh. as your phone along, as long as you make them look. So now you got to go to this effort. It's like going back to the days of haggling almost, except that, that you know, Amazon is your haggle mate. Um, it just seems that the, the local retail, in-person retail is screwed. Yeah. I don't, <laughs> well, it is, it is giving in, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. I think it was a big story. I wonder uh, if and they're... And, you know, and the Amazon pickup boxes, right? That's another one that's interesting. I just saw my first one kind of in person where it was like a, like Radio Shack or something where you could... Locker, is that is that what it's called? When you where you can order stuff and they deliver it to the store and you pick right. it up there. I was kind of like, oh, I, I, it felt a little sad. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is, <laughs> this is too bad for this re retailer. Like they're really hoping I'll buy something while I'm here to pick up my stuff that I bought elsewhere. Yeah. You know, I, I go out... I, I've worked in Manhattan for, for many, 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 many years now. And I used to go out when I was bored or angry and, you know, wander around. And I would hit the <laughs> store and the record store and the electronics store and oh, gone. There's no such thing as browsing in real life anymore. It's just not there. Um, so I don't know. I just found that I found that story to be a big deal about the impact of the Internet beyond robots, beyond replacing things uh, you know, jobs with computers. It's about the impact of transparency and communication and data on an entire economy of retail. I think that was a big moment. So that's my Well, inevitably, if Target does it, it means all the other big retailers will have to follow suit. So the way it works, if a customer buys a qualifying item, well, I'm not sure what that means, at Target, and then finds an identical item for less than the following week's Target circular or within seven days on Amazon.com, Walmart.com, Best Buy.com, and Toys R Us.com, Target will match the price. I think they can do that a little bit with impunity because it's kind of a pain in the ass. Right. Yeah. right? That's what I think, too. I mean, that's why stores offer the price matching thing so much, right? Right. Because nobody be, ever does it. Makes you feel good. It makes you feel it's good. It's a pure psychological thing. I'm sure we had Dan Ariely on last week on Triangulation from uh, the author Predictably Irrational. He is a, a economic psychologist. And I'm sure he would say the reason that you can do that is because nobody ever does it. But psychologically, it gives you the feeling, oh, well, I know I'm getting a good price. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, so you, you would purchase something, bring it home, check the circular, and right. then or check Amazon, and then bring it back to Target and get refunded the difference? Yes. Yeah, it's no one's going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken as a busy mom. Oh, yeah, that's, that's not happening. <laughs> yeah, it's not happening. <laughs> you say, I know this is cheaper on Amazon, and they look it up for you right then and there, and they give you the other price. It you doesn't. It, the, the details are yet to come, but that That's was what they, yeah. on ABC. So unless they, unless they really lied to their teeth, they show the guy coming in. He picks a camera and a something and a something, a toy and a something, and he marches up front and says he shows us. You know, he's checking his phone. And says I know I know what the real price is on Amazon. He goes up front and says we give you the price, and they say let me look him up. They look him up and they give him that price. 
I right. think that's the local television news making up their idea of what will happen. <laughs> I don't think that's how it's going to work. Maybe. JBC Network. Oh, well, they're, they're imp impeccable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you agree with The Verge that the Amazon is the only unstoppable monster in tech today? I disagree. You know who's the unstoppable monster? Just ask Apple. It's Samsung. Yeah. What is Apple's price now? It's dropped almost 200 points in the last two months. Samsung announced its biggest re earnings ever in 2012. Uh, it's, it's, I was watching the CNBC Squawk Box. Jim Cramer said Samsung is the new Apple. Mm. Interesting. And Samsung is putting on its own operating system on phones next? Tizen. Actually, you know what it is? And you'd be mm -hmm. equipped to talk about this, Aaron. It's Linux. Um, it's, now, of course, Android's Linux with a Java Dalvik on top. Yeah. But yeah. this is not that. This Linux is just, kernel. this is like Ubuntu's phone or Firefox's operating system. Well, Ubuntu phone, that's what I wanted to talk about. Um, real quick, just on the Tizen thing. I mean, that's HTML5. That's what Tizen's all about. So Tizen is running HTML5 apps on the phone. On top um, of a Linux operating system. On top system. of a Linux operating system. So that's and it's what, true Linux. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's really what I think Samsung is, is pushing and wants to push is, hey, just run HTML5 everywhere. Now we'll see if it goes anywhere. Now um, the real question is, are they doing this in addition to Android or is this a response to Google? And uh, they they would like to be out from under Google's thumb and, and, and want to do something different. Uh, yeah, exactly. I think they're hedging think their that? bets. I think they're hedging their bets. I think they, well, and I think it helps them because they are not, um, it gives them, um, it gives Google less control. I was going to say it gives them more control. It really doesn't. It gives Google less control. If everybody's writing HTML5 apps, right. they can do whatever they want, and Google doesn't have the purse strings necessarily. I, I think Amazon makes so much money on Android, and it costs mm -hmm. them nothing. Mm -hmm. that whatever mini minimal restrictions Google places on what they do, right. it's worth it. I think so, too. I it's think so, worth too. It. But did you, did you see this Ubuntu phone, though? Yeah. Um, at CES, there's a video of it in the rundown. They actually showed it last year as well. But it's closer to fruition, I guess. Right, right. This is actually... Um, I'll, I'll get the video up here. Yeah, it's actually pretty cool. So uh, Ubuntu's been running on tablets. In fact, they run on Nexus 7, um, have been for a, for a little while now, a few months. They were, they've been starting to show that kind of stuff. But they actually had a phone, and it looks like a, a, a Galaxy Nexus to me in the video. I think it is, yeah. And they're running their own operating system on it. Uh, and, this uh, is uh, one of the native you, applications. You can cut the audio. We don't need the audio, just the video, yeah. That's Mark Shuttleworth what? there demonstrating it. Um, it, what I like about it is, I mean, they've done some actually some some pretty cool things. It looks like Windows Mobile. <laughs> it looks a little bit like it Windows does. Mobile. They've got <laughs> menus on the sides of the of the Every, device. All four sides uh, swipe in. Yeah. Now, the really cool thing here and where they're taking advantage of their position in the Linux desktop space is, I think Mark says this at the end of the video, is I take the phone home, I dock it or put it on some sort of device, and my phone changes, the display goes over to my big screen, right. and it becomes my Linux desktop. On, from the same device. So you've got this mobile experience on the phone, but then when you go back and you've got a big screen, then you've got keep, the, keep the, the, the yeah, Ubuntu yeah, okay. desktop um, experience. Now, he didn't show that, but he talks about that's what they want to do, is they want to take this so that you just have this one device, you've got a monitor at home, you've got this uh, phone on the road, and when you get home, you lay the phone on a pad or something, and all of a sudden your Ubuntu desktop comes up, all your data's there, everything's mm -hmm. connected. Um, I don't see that as compelling. In fact, uh, Asus and others have done that with the Transformer and mm -hmm. it didn't take off. But, uh, you know, and you could do that right now if you just got the right dock with almost any Android phone. Mm -hmm. But I do think this is actually a beautiful UI. It is. I actually, They've done a lot of good work I think on this it. This actually looks pretty darn good. Yep. It does. Yep. It has the boxes and the big typography of Windows Mobile, but it does, it looks quite nice, actually. Yeah. It's very Windows Phone ish, but it's very not Android or iPhone ish. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I wish Mark would learn that if he's showing a phone, he shouldn't shake his, move his hands around so much. Yeah. <laughs> it's making me queasy. Uh, interesting. Gmail. I thought it was really interesting. Yeah. Aaron, what are the apps on there? The Gmail app and the Facebook app, are those, those aren't Android apps. They're HTML5. What are they? Yeah. Uh, I think they are probably HTML5. You're probably right because I think that what they've done is they've taken they've they've started to you know, Ubuntu started to deploy these apps on the desktop um, as opposed to just running the the um, uh, the web version, for example, right? Um, and I think that they've basically taken that and put it into the phone. So they're creating their own apps. I'm sure they're all probably HTML5. So it's it's really quite beautiful. Yeah. I thought it was pretty interesting. I was I was impressed. I thought I, I was like, oh yeah, we'll see like a really tiny desktop, and then you know but they you started know, get, demoing it. And I was like, wow, that actually looks pretty good. OS on phones, as a, a lot of people have learned before, 
you know, is, is not easy. You have to make mm -hmm. deals with carriers. Mm -hmm. This, on the other hand, I could see being distributed as a patch to your existing right. Galaxy or Samsung phone. Right, right. You know, this I, is this is almost like a, a ROM, a custom yes, ROM. Yes, exactly. That I'd be very interested in. In fact, I'd, I'd, I'd probably use it right away. Mm -hmm. and of course, now, if, if you lose all your Android apps, maybe that's not an ideal situation. You should be able to run them. Side by side. Should you? You've got enough space. Could yeah. you put Dalvik on here and Yeah, you could run you could run mm. both. Huh. Mm, says Gina mm. Trimani. Mm. Or then how? Not at the same time, but I mean, you know, you'd have to switch oh, back and oh, forth. Oh no, no, I want to run them all. You want to run at the same yeah. time? Yeah. yeah, so I was gonna say it'd be like we'd need like the mm. Dalvik runtime kind of right. on top of yeah, that would be complicated. But Very yeah, complicated. Like, maybe so with blue like stacks. Maybe blue stacks could do it. So blue stacks is that emulator that lets you put android uh, mm -hmm. apps on a windows phone and other devices right yeah windows desktop uh, yeah i run it i've run it on my windows desktop before i logged in and all my apps came up and i was playing fruit ninja on windows it's, it's an android app player in yeah effect. yeah so if you got bluestacks running mm -hmm. on ubuntu phone hmm. mm -hmm. yeah bluestacks is interesting i'm not sure what their end game is um but they're definitely doing some interesting things, porting Android apps to other platforms. Anything else you want to talk about? Firefox 18 ships today with a 25% faster, just-in-time JavaScript engine. I wanted to mention quickly this uh, this Google Play Store uh, hitting a 1 million apps that might That's beat Apple. Amazing. So the Google Play Store might beat the Apple App Store to 1 million apps, which is which is crazy because, I mean, I realize we've been around for a while, we being like Twig, but it just seems like just yesterday we were talking about how there were just so few apps in the Play Store and they really <laughs> needed to, to beef those up. Yeah. <laughs> and it's so different now. And, you know, I mean, I think these numbers are it, 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 getting an app accepted into the iTunes App Store is Apple App Store is a much different thing than submitting something to Google Play. And, and it's true, you know, I was saying this on All About Android last night. You know, anybody can kind of fire up at App Inventor and make a fart app and upload it to Google Play, and that counts as an app that's in the store, right? So, you know, whereas every single Apple app is approved, still, it's uh, it's pretty amazing that that the Play Store and the App Store are, have the same amount of apps. I don't think that this is a number to measure anymore, uh, not for no. these two, certainly for for other operating systems at this point, but but still incredible to see how Android is caught up just with this one particular measure that was really important a while back. The, the, the current rate will be June of this year that they'll reach a million apps. I think it's pretty clear that you're going to say that the turning point, but uh, where the app, you know, right now I would say Apple and Android, are, mm -hmm. iOS and Android are are are, are parity. Mm -hmm. And the real question is 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 it going to now start to flip in Android's favor? And I think so. I think by yeah. the end of this year. It will be twice as, it, not the number of apps, but just everything. It'll be selling twice as many phones, mm -hmm. twice as popular. It's just, it's, Apple is going back to its niche role. The problem is that, that there's a snobbishness that exists, for example, in, among developers and in media both. So you see, you know, and I, I love the guys at Circa, but they make an, uh, an iPhone app and that's it. Uh, I, I complained to somebody else last week, uh, just an iPhone app. Um, uh, PBS did a list of best news apps and they were almost all just for iPhone. And I complained and they said, well, show us some Android. So that's the point. The developers aren't going there. The, uh, the um, economist is driving me nuts because they don't have anything for, the, for an Android tablet. You can't use it there. Uh, Verizon drives me nuts because the, they haven't updated their, their applications for a jelly bean. Um, this, the, the attention still goes to iOS because the developer community is there and, and media executives are there and that's what they have. But the public is unquestionably going to Android and that's where they've got to go, but they're not there yet. So there's, there's a bad attitude. And I think Google could do something here by pointing this stuff out. Google should, should be calling the, 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 the economist and saying, hello, you want some help? What do you want? What's I wouldn't, matter? I wouldn't bother. They will um, follow, they'll follow the yeah, money. Exactly. We saw the same exact thing. Remember, Apple, you know, a Apple has gone through this with the Macintosh. And people who ended up developing for the Macintosh were niche people who made beautiful apps, always better apps than on Windows. But the, but if but if you're the economist, you follow the money mm -hmm. and you make Android apps. And I don't, I think by the end of this year, you'll see that, Jeff. I don't think you're going to, there will still be the circus of the world. There'll be the, the, the iOS developers will be much like OS X developers. They'll be niche -y. Mm -hmm. There's there's still there's still a strong perception though that iOS is where you make the money. I mean, I just I just switched from the iPhone to the Galaxy Nexus and it's like Time Hop, Lyft, the magazine, Letterpress, like really great new apps start on iOS still. Uh, so I I really I'm waiting to see the like cool indie new startup 
launch their their mobile app first on Android, right? We've seen that with like Ingress and, and Field Trip, but those are Google funded projects. We're st we still have to see that third party developer launch on Android first with a lot of success because Android's where they feel like they're going to get the money in the audience. Um, I'm waiting for that. I just, think it's going to happen this year. Just this is the year, just around All the right. corner. All yep. right. There'll be a path. Yes. There'll be an Instagram. <coughs> there'll be an app that. And by the way, that accelerates it um, because as soon as there's an app that's only on Android that everybody has to have, uh, then, yep. ever, then ever then there, there really there is no really much resistance to buying Android at this point anymore. Right. I don't think. I, I think more and more normal people are just saying, "Yeah, what's wrong with I'm going to get an Android phone." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, now it's time to take a break, and then we'll come back with tools, tips, numbers, and more. I love this Mark Cuban story. Is that going to be your number? Uh, I have two numbers. So you no, should no. make that your number. That's a good number. <laughs> I know anything, anything like that I love. But first, hey, we got a new advertiser. I want to tell you about LegalZoom.com. I've used them. Maybe you've even heard of them. LegalZoom is not a law firm, but what they do is they give you legal help, self-help, at your direction, affordable business and personal forms, documents. It's really great for anybody starting their own business. Set up your business, form an LLC at LegalZoom, starting at $99. If you're a blogger, this is something you should pay attention to. Trademark, uh, copyright, patent, NDAs. If you've got a great idea and you want to do an NDA, LegalZoom has it at very affordable prices. This this kind of protection, it doesn't mean you have to go to a law firm and spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars an hour. You could spend $169 and register your trademark with LegalZoom. And if you and if you want family law, with $69, you could do a will or a living trust. By the way, if you don't have a will, you really need to get one. Um, Gina, you guys have a will. We, yeah, we're getting one. We're in the yeah, as soon as you have a yeah. child, you got, you got to get a will. Yep. Um, Two million Americans over the last 12 years have used LegalZoom for LLCs, wills, trusts, trademarks, and more. Their online process couldn't be. It's all online now. When I first used LegalZoom, it wasn't. Now it is. It's very easy. Step by step. You get total customer support. And what they've done now, which I think is fantastic, if you want advice and want to know more, if you feel like, you know, I need some help, they've got an extensive network of attorneys through LegalZoom's legal plans available in most states at a very affordable prices. And that is fantastic. Start your business and protect your family today at LegalZoom.com. Not a law firm, self-help services at your specific direction, or you can speak to a legal plan attorney and get your questions answered and get ongoing advice for very affordable rates. To receive a special thank you for uh, using LegalZoom, make sure you enter our offer code, which is TWIG, Easy to remember. That way, uh, you get a you get a ten dollars off, and we get the credit. It's a nice way of doing that. LegalZoom.com. Use the offer code Twig, and I really want to encourage you. Uh, you know, if you're setting up a business, you got it. There's just some. It's not hard, not complicated. There's some certain steps you just got to take to protect yourself, like trademarks, uh, like LLC, and it's really easy to do. I was thrilled. Yeah, if you're starting a side business, that's the way to do it. Oh, yeah. I, I happen to be surrounded by lawyers at the moment because we're doing the adoption and our will and a bunch of other stuff. But, uh, yeah, no, that's a great that's a yeah. great option if you don't want to have an army of... <laughs> when you go in a room and there's three lawyers in there, I don't know about you, but my I start seeing the numbers uh, it, it floating in from my head as the... <gasps> as the clock yeah. ticks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he's $250 an hour, he's $400, she's $500 an hour. Oh, my God. <laughs> Can we hurry this up? And they're never in a hurry, are they? You notice that? No, no, no. They're never in a hurry to wrap this thing up. Oh, well, let's get out of here early. Bills for telephonic communication. I said, you charge me more for calling it that. Just call it a telephone call. <laughs> telephonic communication. Yeah, that, that, you know why they do that? Because it takes longer to say. <laughs> so they can bill for that. They bill for that. <laughs> That's three extra letters. Big contract. All we, I wanted to do. We got to work on. Uh, I don't know why. Maybe Jeff's using a different Skype now, but he's he's getting echo canceled. So I, whenever I talk, you can't hear him. Hmm. No, that's we can fix that. John knows how to fix that. We'll fix that after the show. Just just make a note of that. All right, it's time for your tip of the week, Gina Trapani. 
Really simple tip this week, a new little uh, thingy in Gmail. Gmail's Compose window now has uh, a label dropdown. So you can add a label to a message before you send it, which sounds kind of crazy. But actually, if you, if you depend on labels and if you organize your stuff with labels, which I absolutely do, it's a huge help. Because normally, if I send a message that I want to file, I've got like a follow-up label. Uh, if I want to file that in the label, you send the message, and then you have to label it afterwards. Now, you just do it while you're composing the message, add your label, and send. And that's in both the, the new Compose experience, which is the, the, the window that opens in the lower right-hand corner, or just your, your regular vanilla Compose window. Very cool. So, and once you get a reply to that, it stays, the labels persist, right? Yeah, the labels, labels now it's are a conver conversation. Yeah, yeah so yeah. so it would be, that conversation would stay within that label. Very good. Your number of the week, Mr. Jeff Jarvis. I'm going to mention this one first because I think it's something interesting. Adam Shirk, S-H-E-R-K, at adamshirk.com, put up some really amazing numbers to me looking at the engagement per post and per site for a whole bunch of news sites on Google+. So, for example, average engagement per post, number one, Mashable. Average of 239 plus ones per post, 87 shares per post, 67 comments per post, a total of 394, thus, interaction per post. I just found these stats to be amazing and to see that those places that are um, uh, trying to make an effort at Google+, Plus and, 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 and new ways to measure engagement, and as somebody pointed out for in one of the comments on my post, uh, it follows Mr. Ergen's uh, uh, rules that you do something that is done for Google+. Plus. You put a big picture up. Uh, so I found that interesting. But more interesting to Leo and thus to the world. But I'm not a real jock. But, but you got to, I watch Mark Cuban myself on Shark Tank. But Cuban gets in trouble regularly for what he says online. And he got fined $50,000 uh, for a tweet that complained about officiating at a game. And uh, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> the tweet was was pretty innocuous too. It was just kind of like, I mean, it was it was criticism, but it was like, I'm sorry that I haven't been able to, you know, that, that the refereeing isn't better or the officiating isn't better, right? Like I failed at, at making it better. It wasn't even like a really mm. mean tweet, a fifty thousand dollar tweet. I guess it's just cigarette money for him, but it still, it doesn't <laughs> seem like he should be able to be fined for a tweet. It's a ridiculous industry. Yeah, I guess because he's an owner. They can do anything they want. He said, I'm sorry, NBA fans. I've tried for 13 years to fix the officiating in this league, and I have failed miserably. Any suggestions? I need help. That's because, of course, his team lost by three points to the New Orleans Hornets on Saturday. It's the officiating! <laughs> you have a, a tool, Mr. Aaron? You know, I can do one. Um, actually, this was in the rundown here, and I, I picked it up, and I thought, you know what? If, if I need to do one, this is going to be it because it's pretty cool. It's uh, power searching with Google. I don't know. Did you put this in, Gina, or who put this in? Maybe it was Chad or somebody else. Tell us. It uh, was there when I, when I saw the rundown. It looks really cool, though. It does look cool. I was wondering if you knew about this. So uh, if you just go to powersearchingwithgoogle.com, uh, you will find some sessions. It's basically courses in how to use Google Search better. And it's it, I think it looks pretty pretty cool. I mean, if you want to sign up, if you want to figure out, they, they offered one in um, Power Searching not too long ago, and now they're doing one in Advanced Power Searching. So um, I guess this is really targeted towards researchers. If you are a researcher and you're doing a project and you really need to get down and dirty and get a lot of data and, and crunch through it, um, and you want to use Google to do that, then this is a course that you would really uh, really want to do. But if not, they also offer the power searching course on demand so you can learn more about how to get the most out of Google searches. So check it out. Wow. Do you think you really need a course in searching? I mean, it's funny, you know, like what my first reaction was that like, oh, if your product is so complicated that you have to offer a course on how to use it, then there's something wrong. But there, Google search really does have so many, you mm -hmm. know, cool op operators and hidden kind of advanced techniques like that you really can do a course. I mean, I know at Lifehacker, our, our Google power searching tips articles always sort of like the traffic on them always went through the roof. People love them and ate them up. And it's funny, I sort of start using new advanced operators sort of one at a time, you know, like you know, sort of reading, seeing the whole cheat sheet all at once, you don't really digest them, but once you sort of start to get used to using them. But I think it's a good idea to say, here's a problem. Here's a researcher problem, mm. thing that they want to find, and here are the search techniques you would use to get to them. Yeah, there are a lot, of, of, course. Let's there are do a lot that. of little things that, that people don't realize um, are there. I mean, I just, I guess I had, I knew about it, but I forgot about the image search, the image matching search you can do. Yeah. Um, if you go to google.com and then click image, 
uh, there's a little drop down you can change to search for similar images. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's such a cool little feature. And I, I guess I, I heard about it and I was like, yeah, yeah. And then I needed to use it. And and I used it and I was like, oh, I'm going to use this every day now. It's so cool. You know what I would There's love a- to do is is uh, do a weekly search challenge on the show. Oh, that'd be kind of fun. Give, give, us, give us a researcher search challenge. Maybe that'd the, be kind of fun. Maybe the audience can do that. Maybe we should set it up in the uh, in the Google Plus community and ask yep. for a search challenge. There's a, have you guys seen this documentary Catfish about this yeah, guy? Who yeah. Fell, yeah. So there's a show now. Like he turned it into a show on MTV, uh, and it's for people who are in these online relationships who go and meet the person, and find out that they're not at all who they represented themselves. Anyway, this show, like the majority of the show, is is the guy, the host, showing people that if you just take the person's profile picture who you think you're in love with and <laughs> drop it into Google <laughs> Image Search, mm-hmm. you will find where the Truth. person like janked the photo from right. to make it look like it's them. <sighs> Love and uh, it just makes me laugh. Oh, I because, love that. You know, these people are just so in love, and it's been two years of, you know, Facebook message I am, you know, that they're so invested in. And it's like this guy just pops the image in, and he's like, yep, no, actually, this person lives in Texas. And <laughs> <laughs> so he does that each, each week? He does another... Uh... Yeah, each week it's another person who's in love with someone oh who they've never met God. on Facebook or whatever. And one of the first things he does is take the profile picture and put it in Google Image Search, search by image to find similar, you know, other web pages where this same image is shown up, you know. And it's almost always fake profiles. It's almost always someone sad and old and fat and trolly, <sighs> troll looking, you know, who like really wants to look like a model. Sorry, everyone being sizest. But yeah, so that's I. It just makes me laugh. So I'm like, oh, it's a course in Google <laughs> on MTV. Aaron Newcomb is uh, a regular on our Floss Weekly show. Mm-hmm. That's why he's here. He came up to do that with uh, Randall Schwartz, but that's he right. also uh, has his own show, thesourcesshow.org. I hesitate to say that. You haven't put up an yeah, episode in a while. Yeah, you have to. I'm waiting for you to start your maker show. Then <laughs> will you we be, can combine efforts. Will you be part of that? I would love to be part All of right. that. All right. Once you get around to it. I saw Make Magazine is advertising for hosts. Yes. So I decided because we were talking for a while with them, but you know we kind of we kind of let them down. We didn't. We we've been delaying and delaying. So maybe mm-hmm. we'll just have to do it without the help of Make Magazine. And yeah. Just build radios out of there you raspberry go. pies and That's things right. like that. I want to do it. Let's yeah. Absolutely. Got to do that. Absolutely. So forget the source show. <laughs> it's history. Follow me on Google Plus. That's the best place. That's the best place. Yep. Google A-A-R-O-N. Plus. A A R O N. N e w c o m b, and I'm I am that on you know all the social networks so Facebook, Twitter, but especially Google Plus because I get a lot of interaction. That's where a lot of people were asking me, hey, are you going to mention your radio that you're building? Because you mentioned it last time, are you going right. to mention it again? And uh, so I said, oh, I'll just bring along what I've got and show it off. So You'll know you have the right Aaron Newcomb when you see the A plus logo. A plus, yeah. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, you everybody. Thanks for Jeff, having me. Jeff Jarvis is at uh, BuzzMachine.com. And he's also a professor of journalism at the City University of New York. And uh, anything else I should plug? Oh, yes, Public Parts, that fabulous book. See, he can't can't talk when I talk, which could be useful. Hey. (laughs) Hey. (laughs) We shall fix that. Gina Trapani is at smarterword.org and thinkup.com. And uh, is the author of todo.txt, which is a great text-based to-do list for Android and iPhone. And new co-host of All About Android oh, that's right. on Tuesday night. Oh, ooh, ooh. That's great. So tonight Tuesday you'll probably rehash some of the things we talked about and more. <laughs> well, last, night. Last, last night. Last night. Actually. Yeah, oh. yeah. It's, it's wonderful. My All About Android prep sort of feeds my twig prep. So Perfect. So, uh, yeah, it's very efficient. Perfect. And uh, we just released our new uh, ThinkUp 2.0, our first beta. It's a t- total total revamp uh, of, the, of the application. So you can check it out. If you're, if you're up for fiddling around with a PHP application on your web server, you should download the, the beta and check it out. Yeah, this is this is what you get. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is. <laughs> yeah, don't we, don't we get have... excited. <laughs> if you if you know what to do next, you should get it. <laughs> you know what to do from there. Yeah, from, from the Apache file listing, that, 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 that unzip, then and you're then then that's for you. You should try the beta. <laughs> Think up is awesome. <laughs> All right, we do this show every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, on UTC time, that would be, I think, 2200 UTC at twit.tv. Do I add seven or eight? I think I had eight, so actually it'd be 2100 UTC on twit.tv. Uh, but you can also get, uh, after the fact, get on demand 
versions of audio and video versions of the show at twit.tv slash twig or wherever you subscribe to podcasts. In fact, please do subscribe. That way you'll get it every week. 9 p.m. GMT. I don't care about GMT. I want UTC. I guess GMT is the same thing, right? So 9 p.m. 2100 UTC. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Mom says, it's easy, Gina. Download, unzip, install. <laughs> it, it is. What could be what could be easier? Easier. Well, FTP. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everybody for joining us. We'll see you next week on Twig.